Hey, race fans, Hall of Famer Daryl Walter here. You know it's time to drop the green flag on another edition of Meaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. So, hey, pull those belts tight one more time. Here's my buddy Hermie Sadler and Senator Bill Stanley. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's see what they have to say, boys and girls. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm leaning right. And I'm former NASCAR driver and Fox Sports analyst, Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left, leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pace of Medic. Senator, how are you? I'm well. How are you, sir? We're back. It looks like we had a little delay after, uh, after a major candidacy, uh, the candidate episode. Uh, we're going to explain all that here in a little bit, but it's good to see you, my friend. Yeah, good to be back and excited to pump out another episode here of leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the Senator excited to talk about some exciting stuff that's going on in the world of politics, but also talk a little bit about Sadler Stanley racing. We're getting into the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we want to update everybody on some things going on with that. And even though the holiday season is coming and the year is winding down, still a lot for us to talk about here on the podcast. I want to take a moment and thank our friends over at Pacematic for giving us this opportunity. Pacematic is an entertainment company which develops gaming software that players love to play and can use their skills to win every single time. Plus, these games of skill provide vital revenue to keep family-owned businesses like bars, restaurants, convenience stores, and truck stops thriving, especially close to us, Bill, right here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we go back to court on, because I get a lot of calls about this, a lot of people, you know, rumors and things, of, you know, we go back to court on December the 5th, and then I think after that, and you correct me if I'm wrong, we'll be able to give people more of a, uh, more of an update about where we are and how, we're, where we're headed, and of course, you guys have got General Assembly session coming up, a lot of moving mm -hmm. parts and pieces uh, as we come in here for the next couple of months. You're exactly right, and uh of course, on December 5th, um, the judge will read its, uh, his ruling from the bench with regard to two issues that are before the court uh, regarding our skill game lawsuit. The first issue being, uh, did the insertion of a change in the criminal code violate the single object rule in our Constitution? Our Constitution has something which prevents log rolling, where you, you write a bill and then everybody attaches something to it that's not related, that, that every bill, every piece of legislation has to have a single object. Uh, and that this violated that constitutional provision. The court wanted information on that. They felt that was really important. And then uh, the question of whether the skill game ban in the budget was a violation of free speech, uh, government overreaching a, a free speech, or was it merely trying to um, guide the conduct of the individual, not affecting the speech? And that's kind of a legal wonky uh, um statement right there, but what you're basically saying is, is a skill game, when it uh, transmits a theme and message, is it protected by the First Amendment? The question was answered earlier by the court. That's a yes. The second question, though, is with the new skill game ban and the way that they worded it, are they still recognizing the free speech element of the skill game, but just regulating conduct of the player itself? And therefore, there is no free speech implicated in the new rule. So, uh, We've all submitted briefs. The attorney general's office submitted a brief that basically took what I thought was another swipe at a losing argument, which was basically that these are not games of skill. They're games of chance. And they're just like every other slot machine. Uh, even though they had expert witnesses prepared to testify, Trotha would have said, no, there's skill involved. But they're back to saying these are just gambling machines. There's no inherent value to them. There is illegal as a as a slot machine, an electronic slot machine would be. They spent a lot of time on the brief on that. But the 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 judge, I'm not an attorney, although I have learned a lot from watching you guys and the legal team through the process. You're about ready to sit for the but, bar exam <laughs> with all that experience. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the judge had to, in some ways, already rule on the fact that these were games of skill in some way wouldn't he have done that because he gave us a an injunction on the on the prior bill so haven't we already in 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 certain respects made our case in court that these are games of skill and not chance and the games 
by the way, have not changed. They're the same ones we've been operating all along. Correct. And and the court did say that there was a First Amendment implication, and that part of that was is the video interaction with the player and that there was an element of skill involved, that a player playing a skill game can win based on the use of his or her skill in the game, and after using his or her, her skill and winning the game, then they're entitled to uh, what would be a reward, uh, a prize, uh, and they can continue to do that. Games of chance, as we've said before, and we'll say it again here, that's a slot machine, like pulling the one-armed bandit, letting go, and wherever they land, they land. And the you know, yeah, yeah, and the and the player has no opportunity to win the game. It is merely based on whether uh, cherry, cherry, cherry shows up, and and that had nothing to do with the skill of the player. So there's very there's a very good and easy definition of the difference between a game of skill and a game of chance. But the Virginia Attorney General's office uh, basically wanted to relitigate that issue, even though, as you, as you said, and you were right, uh, the judge had already determined that issue, uh, that it was a game of skill. So they seem to be fixated on these are just gambling machines, which is really not a part of the argument. The argument is, does the skill game ban violate, which is a criminal code inserted into a Virginia budget, which is unheard of because we always argue Virginia – uh, pieces of legislation that involve changing the criminal code before the courts of justice committees in both the House and the Senate. And instead, that only went to finance, and they wrote a bill that would take away the liberty interests of individuals who might either play the game or have the game in their small convenience store or their small business. And, and that, without a full public hearing, I think is illegal. And because it has nothing to do with the budget, violates the single object rule. Well, you know, we'll talk more about it, update people. Uh, as we get closer and then after certainly the uh, December 5th trial date, we'll be able, we'll know more then. We, some things we just don't know at this point. But one thing I do know, uh, you may or may not want to comment on this, but I can. You know, right out here, about a, less than a half a mile from here in, in, in Emporia, I've got a convenience store on Market Drive in Emporia that we have legally operated skill games in there for years and i took a video on my phone over the weekend that i'm gonna put up on my social media at some point this week especially if you wait more than three days to talk to me sometime this week <laughs> but basically you know they're building a brand new rosie's right here in emporia the back of rosie's as it butts up to my property on market drive you can you can walk through from the back door of that store to Rosie's 50 yards, 50 yards. And so what the casinos are still pushing the attorney general's office to make happen is ban all these games, even though we've legally operated them for all these years, ban them so places like Rosie's will have a monopoly. So they're basically telling people you can't go entertain yourself with with that type of gaming at Hermes place, but never fear. You can walk 50 yards across the parking lot and go into Rosie's at a place that you know, that we support and that we think needs to have an advantage and we think that needs to have a monopoly and turning their back on small business and the casinos and the, unfortunately, the AG's office by, I guess, under the, some of the pressure I guess we're supposed to be careful about what we say and all that crap, but mm -hmm. um, they're not. They're 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 pushing. The casino people are pushing, and I feel obligated to say this because I say it every time. The the majority won. The majority of people here in Emporia voted for Rosie's to come to Emporia. I accept that and I respect that. I just firmly believe that Rosie's and these other casinos, as they start making their way into the Commonwealth of Virginia. They should simply have to operate on the same level playing field that I do at my places. They shouldn't have advantages. They shouldn't have a monopoly. They shouldn't be able to start the game on second base. They've got enough advantages already with tax incentives and other things that these locales, localities do to bring them in. And as you and I say many, many times, small businesses are the backbones of these economies in some of these areas in South South Virginia and some of these legislators and certainly the casinos are turning their back on small businesses in the Commonwealth of Virginia. 
And I just feel like I need to keep reminding people of that because as elections get closer in time, you know, people can make those decisions based on what, who, why did these, it, did these legislators support when they start seeing some of the collateral damage that's going to be caused in some of these neighborhoods. Well, and I mean, you, not only that, you just take the mess that's created by the General Assembly really not understanding what they had in front of them, handling it properly, doing it in an open and transparent way. I mean, you had skill games, which were always legal. Pandemic comes when they were trying to shut them down. They said, okay, we'll keep them open. Brought hundreds of millions of dollars to Virginia. And then they said, no, now we're going to try to ban them under the SB 971. That was an unconstitutional and illegal law. The court has already temporarily and preliminarily found that to be the case. And then what they did at the same time, because, again, we're trying to give a monopoly to an emerging uh, in an emerging industry in Virginia to an out-of-state large casino group. Rosie's just got bought by Churchill Downs for a, a god-awful amount of money. And now, you know, what we saw in the General Assembly last year was uh, them trying to get rid of charitable gaming. Uh, and so what you have then is as soon as they filed SB 971 and tried to put the ban in place the first time, then you saw this proliferation just through the front doors we've talked about. Huge number of uh, games of chance coming in and replacing those games of skill that the that the manufacturers willingly said, okay, we're going to follow the law, pulled out. So it didn't stop illegal gaming in Virginia. I think it made it worse. Uh, then they've tried to, you know, um, stop charitable gaming or minimize it to a very nub from what it was before because they said, well, that that interferes with casinos because, you know, if you're offering Texas Hold'em or you have games in a VFW, a veteran foreign wars uh, a place or, or someplace like that, you – you are cutting into the profits of the casinos. So they tried to pass a law in, uh, that did that. Now you see Chap Peterson. It's in the news. Chap Peterson's a state senator. Uh, he's fighting for charitable. You know They're even trying to get bingo to go out of the bingo halls and the charitable bingo halls. And he says basically that the law they wrote in last year's General Assembly session of 2022 was in conflict with another law. So, in fact, they messed that up and— while trying to strip uh, the Charitable Gaming Commission of its, uh, of its oversight and its regulatory authority. In fact, what they did was they created two conflicting laws, and if the last law comes in uh, and it's in conflict with an existing law and doesn't repeal it, well, then guess what? The new law is, has no effect. So now you've got new court cases going on right now uh, in Charitable Gaming, Chap Pearson fighting for uh, those charities that use Charitable Gaming in order to uh, create revenue so that they can take care of dogs, cats, veterans, uh, and the like. And so you've got a mess on your hands going into January session about charitable gaming, about skill gaming, and even about casino gaming at the same time that the casinos are saying, hey, we've got these now, these temporary casinos opening up in malls, like they got one in Bristol and they want one now in Danville. Um, you've got casinos type uh, rosies going up in all these places where they've been voted in. Uh, and we have something on our hands that has grown into an 800-pound bear that we can't get our arms around, and we've made it worse. So the General Assembly is usually pretty good in its use of its checks and balances and reviews to pass good laws. Occasionally we pass uh, bad ones, but this one, we've created an ungodly mess, and it's up to us when we get back to the General Assembly to fix it. And fixing it is, is quite frankly, in my mind, and of course I can't vote on it because I represent you, so at R36 yep. I would abstain, uh, but, but I can still tell you what I think the fix is. The fix is go back to the old regime where skill games were legal, they were, they were uh, regulated by ABC, you knew when you saw one it was a skill game, it was registered, had a yellow sticker on it, if it didn't have that, it's illegal, got to go. Uh, pretty easy. And then they've got to straighten out charitable. Um, but I think what we're going to see, especially now that the new report's out on uh, on fiscal revenues and, and our health uh, financially in Virginia, is still good. But there's a lot of uncertainty with all this um, inflation and, and lower income expectations that they're going to need this kind of revenue. And they got to get rid of the, uh, the illegals, keep the legals, and quite frankly, stop playing into the hands of casinos here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yeah, that's been the big problem. Um, my old buddy, Darrell Waltrip, 
he, when he would always tell stories about things about racing and or we had TV meetings, you know, you, you plan for one and he always brought up unintended consequences. And I really think we've got a lot of unintended consequences with what we what we're faced with in the Commonwealth of Virginia, in your words, trying to get our arms around this this bear uh, that is the growing gaming industry in Virginia, because I think the General Assembly, blinded by the light or blinded by the cash or blinded by the whatever you want to say it, they had blinders on to get rid of skill games so these casinos would have a monopoly. And in the process of not considering the unintended consequences, not only have they opened up a can of worms in skill games and in, in casinos and charitable and everything else, and it would be Nobody wants to sit down in a room, Bill, and just have a conversation because you you would think we put 10, 12, you know, people. It's a lot of smart men and women in the General Assembly. Sit them all down and say, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Let's do this. What do you think about that? We want to regulate this. We want to tax that. We want to do all stay in our lane. We want to work together to get rid of illegals. But there is such a, and I just said it a few minutes ago, the further we get down the road, the casinos seem to be more willing and, and they're they're just fighting harder and dirtier and everything else, in my opinion. Um, that you know, they 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 won't they, they're not planning on stopping until they get a monopoly. And by getting a monopoly, they're gonna put a lot of small businesses potentially out of business and affect a lot of families and people that they haven't considered or don't care about or whatever the case may be. And, you know, you can speak for yourself, but as far as for me, um, I don't like bullies and um, this Commonwealth of Virginia, the, the revenues and the economies in places like I live in were built by the free market system, free enterprise and capitalism. And what they're doing is going flying right into the face of that. And I'm going to fight as long as I can possibly fight. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. And, and look, it comes down to a simple notion. Virginia must control the casinos as we move forward in this new gaming industry, or the casinos will control Virginia. And you know, some might, yeah, some might say, well, what does that mean? It's a simple uh, meaning. Um, this is a large, huge industry. Remember the history of the industry – you know, it doesn't come from, well, you know, a bunch of nuns decided to have a poker hall. Um, no, it comes from, you know, um, Bugsy Siegel and Vegas and, you know, running the numbers games and rackets and that stuff. I mean, its basis uh, is in a vice of human, you know, interaction and human nature, which is gambling. Uh, and it capitalizes on that. Its mantra, its motto is the house always wins. And so with that kind of dominating force, if, if you let them in Virginia, uh, it's kind of like letting that bear into your pantry. Uh, you better be really strong enough to tell the bear what it can eat and what it can't eat in your pantry. Otherwise, it's going to eat everything in there and wreck the kitchen while it's there. And that's exactly what I mean when I say Virginia must control casinos or the casinos will control Virginia. And, you know, when you talk about some of the underhanded stuff, you know, I've been dealing with it, too. Um, you know, we talked about this earlier in the podcast, uh, lobbyists were, were around saying, you know, the, the news is, you know, the, the, the papers are the newspapers, the reporters are sniffing around, uh, calling, you know, dominion and, and other sources trying to dig up dirt, obviously motivated, um, from what I'm told in my opinion, based on what I'm told, uh, that could have been, uh, driven by that industry, uh, because you and I dared to fight. And so since I'm a public figure, uh, they've been trying to then ask questions. And, you know, my, my, my story is an open book. I've got nothing to hide. It's not like I'm doing anything wrong. And yet uh, we see stories now coming out about my chairmanship, being at the chairman of the board of directors at New College Institute, a struggling um, high red center in Virginia in struggling um, Henry County and Martinsville that, quite frankly, uh, was brought to us by the General Assembly in delivering a new basis of education, that is video online education, which now you can do at your home where you never have to get out of your, out of your jammies. I took over the chairmanship to try to save it. 
in terms of changing it and how we deliver education, how we can deliver education to children who are living at or below the poverty level who can't afford college or don't have the four years to go to college but can still get trained, get credential, and get a, a great job that breaks the cycle of poverty, pay them $60,000, 80000 a year for that job that we train them in. Uh, yeah, and we and we were shut down during the pandemic, and lo and behold, here comes a three-part series about NCI and how we've done nothing except waste taxpayer money. Uh, and I've gotten more than one phone call about people saying, that's a hit piece, and here's where it came from. And lo and behold, it's usually about, it came from, supposedly, uh, that very side of the aisle, which doesn't want skill games, doesn't want our lawsuit, never thought we'd be successful, never thought we'd amount to anything. And so you know, they're willing to go that direction. And so, you know, listen, I was think, think, think how petty that is yeah. to be a legislator, duly elected legislator in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And because somebody has a different view than you, or somebody doesn't like the fact that you stand up for what you think is right and fighting for people's rights and small businesses, think of how petty it is to be one of these other people and a lobbyist that works for the casinos to look around and say, hmm, Bill Stanley doesn't like everything that I like, and he doesn't believe in everything I believe in, and he's fighting against something that we're not used to being fought against, you know, the casino, mammoth, monopoly, all that. What can we do to try to hurt him and his family? What can we do to undercut him, to bring bad press to him, you know, we're not doing anything. You're not doing anything wrong, illegal. You're stepping out on behalf of me as a friend, even outside of politics, to help me fight something that if you read the um, Republican Creed of Virginia, you're supposed to be a Republican. You read it. It's the first thing it talks about is the importance of the free market system. Yet everybody turns their nose up when you ask question, how do you how do you join, how do you say that you care about the free market system yet support an industry that is doing anything they can do to get a monopoly? But instead of having a conversation or coming to the table and trying to discuss it, this is why I think this, why do you think that? They're like they want to throw these darts, yeah. you know, and try to do everything they can to, you know, to hurt people. And it's uh it's really frustrating. It's really, really frustrating. And that's why I say uh, I've said for the last you know couple of weeks since I announced uh, officially that I was going to run for Senate, obviously I have no political experience. The person I'm going to run against in a primary does. But so people get to choose. You know, is political experience what you want and need or somebody that's not a part of the establishment? Who knows? But it just makes me sad that people in those positions rather than facing it and having a conversation about it and talking about all the people in Virginia that are going to be negatively impacted to your point. If you let the casinos just run, run the Commonwealth, you know, but what can they do? They hadn't been able to beat us in court yet. Yeah. They can't make a stop. Nope. We've been winning. Yep. So let's see what we can do to make Bill Stanley look bad. Take off some of that shine. Yeah. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, you're trying to do good things for the, for the people in your district. The needs of the people in your district or have nothing to do with the people in Fairfax and Northern Virginia. Yeah. And but any time they can throw a dart, they throw it. Yeah. And, and NCI at New College Institute is hopefully a foundation for delivery of education and training. That's what we've been trying to get to. I took it over about five years ago just as chairman of the board. I don't run the thing day to day. Uh, and we've been trying to untangle itself from where it got tangled up and then move in a new direction. We were moving in that new direction, had an executive director, Karen Jackson, who was doing a great job. Pandemic hit, shut us all down, sh shut all our programs down. Ralph Northam's government said, don't go to work. People were, were working remotely. Uh, you can't bring students in during a pandemic. So it really kind of thumped us. And, and we were coming out of it, you know, here. And then so... Here comes this story that, oh, they're just doing nothing over there but wasting taxpayer money. You know, one of the questions I was asked, because the assumption, I guess, whatever was made, was that I guess I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars in this position as chairman of the board of uh, directors, and I, I make zero. The time I dedicate is creating overall overarching policy, approving budgets, living on 
a thin budget in terms of higher ed centers. We are the out of four higher ed centers in our area, we're the third lowest in terms of what money we get from the state. We've got no help from our foundation, which has sitting on $14 million. We're trying to get by to, to do the right thing so that this is an entity, this is a platform to help uh, men and mo- women, uh, young uh, students who may not have a chance at college to, who, and who might be living at or below the poverty level to have a chance. And then it turns into, oh, well, Stanley just driving this thing into the ground instead of trying to save it. And so the, it's a series of four articles. The first one, from what I heard from some of these people, and remember, there are 73 lobbyists in the Commonwealth of Virginia that are hooked into casinos. <laughs> That's a lot. I mean, who only needs 73? Se- only 73. Only 73. I mean, if you think of that, if you do the math, that's one lobbyist per two legislators. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a lot of money for two people. You got out. You Sorry, I just snorted. That's I know. Funny. That's not a good. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so I'm hearing from some of these people on the fringe uh, who call me, who I've known for many years, uh, who are saying, yeah, they didn't like they didn't like the first piece because I was honest and open. Of course, I'm going to sit down with the press, tell them everything was going on. It wasn't hitty enough. It didn't hit you hard enough. So they came back, and I guess they must have complained. Think, think about having that much control when you can push someone in the media to do a piece. Allegedly. And then when the piece comes out, call that person back and say, hey. That wasn't hard enough. That piece wasn't – that that didn't hit him hard enough. Can you re-rack it and, and – and do it again? Yeah. Unbelievable. So, so the fourth article uh, is about when we had actually a retreat, which was planned. We had planned it way before any of this article was ever uh, put together. We put it in the in the beginning of the summer so that we can plan our future uh, with a new board of directors. And the, the guy sits over there for we, – we went from 8.30 in the morning till about 5 o'clock in the evening. And if you read the fourth article, all he talks about is stuff that is – I mean, you would have thought we went to two different meetings, but I guess I guess perhaps allegedly uh, the first hit piece wasn't hitty enough, so they had to make the second piece hittier, and uh, and it's just sad. If that's the case, if that's the case, then it's sad, and it shows you, you the you state of journalism, shows you the state of our our politics and government, where this is now the norm, whether it's at the state level and the national level. We used to say in the general assembly. We don't do any of that stuff that happens across the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. We're different. Well, you know what? Day by day, we're getting more and more alike. We're controlled by special interest. We don't have an independent thought in our body. If you dare disagree with us, we're going to go after you with both guns ablazing. And nobody is allowed to have any contrary opinion other than whatever big business or the, or the party in power says. Let me tell you something. Um, me and you both, I mean— I run a business, you run a business, we have families. Sometimes the decisions we make work out exactly like we want them to. Sometimes there are bumps in the road that you have to fix things. For me and for most reasonable Virginians, you only have to look at and what we talk about and think about what are your intentions? What are your intentions? Your intentions for the the, the college programs that you're involved in, your intentions are to do good things for people that don't, you know, not always in positions to go to colleges, four-year colleges, and provide other opportunities, industry, and things of that nature. That's the intent of that program. Yes. So they're coming in and, you know, cherry-picking little issues to highlight them because through COVID and through a pandemic, there's been a few bumps in the road. So let's throw all the rocks we can at Bill, even though your intentions are good. What are the casino, what are the casino's intentions for the Commonwealth of Virginia? To make money and send it back to Vegas and Jersey. At all costs. Correct. Correct. So to me, and I think as we move forward in this process, for for the majority of of conservative Virginians that care about the Constitution and care about people's rights and you know, care about what's right and what's good about the Commonwealth of Virginia, they're going to see past all that because, you know, I'm going to make mistakes. We make bad decisions. We have to fix them. We, you know, we have a plan, marketing plan that we hatch doesn't work. We have to adjust and, and do something else. But on the casino side of it, when you blatantly, honestly, openly think that you can use your money, power, and influence, and 70 whatever lobbyists to bully your way into Virginia 
and create all this collateral damage for these small businesses and the people that work in them and their families and all that. Don't even talk to me about all that trash. Don't even, don't even bring it. Yeah. It's foolish. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, it's funny because I've gotten a lot of phone calls of people just very sympathetic and they know what I'm doing and they know why I'm trying to do this. I mean, I, I have better things, um, to do. Everybody does, but I find, uh, nothing more important than trying to save, uh, my region that has been decimated by government action through the North American Free Trade Agreement, Central American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA and CAFTA, as they were called, sent all our jobs overseas, uh, ruined which uh, an area, uh, government actions changed a, an area that was the top tip of the spear in economic development in all of the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, because it decided people should wear cheaper sneakers uh, than quality sneakers, sent our furniture businesses across the way. So every day I want a, an economic revitalization, and I think this, this part of New College is a part of that component. It's not the be-all and end-all, but I think it's also just as important. And you don't want to have a government program, uh, and it's, it's only $2.8, $2.9 million a year, uh, to fail in this area, because guess what? When you go back and say, hey, we have this other great economic initiative, the government's going to say, well, how did that other one work out? It didn't work out there, so why are we going to come back and, and do anything for you now? Uh, it's important for those children to break the cycle of poverty. And many people have called me up and said, hey, Bill, you know, just get away from it. You know, why don't you just, you know, let somebody else handle it or you resign? I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to let them do that. And I'm not going to sit there and kowtow or give in to whatever motivations might be behind what this writing is all about, what these articles are all about. It motivates me even more to work on the things that we put together uh, moving forward to make New College Institute NCI a success. And I will not give up, nor will I ever give in, especially when I made a commitment to try to fix it, uh, just because it's politically expedient for me to walk away. That's not going to happen. And if that was their intent, that's not going to happen. What The irony is of it, Danville next door to Martinsville, half an hour east of Martinsville. Uh, same problem in NAFTA and CAFTA. They have decided that the casino is their panacea, their white pill that's going to solve all their economic problems, when in fact they were rebuilding their economy, I thought, quite strongly with, guess what, a higher ed center and a community college. Uh, and they were doing it ad adroitly with their economic development team. They are doing a great thing. Now we're putting up a big casino where the old, uh, where the old uh, fabric company was, uh, the mill was in the Danville uh, mill, and we're going to, unfortunately, I'm predicting, and I represent Danville, um, but I won't if I'm elected in the 7th District next year. Um, but you're going to see all that economic growth outside of the casino, I think, kind of start to slow down and stop. And, and the casino will dominate Danville for its economy, uh, for its jobs, and for its crime. And so you're going to reap what you sow there. Uh, I love Danville. It's one of the greatest cities in all of Virginia. But they're just going to take over like that ink stain that spreads out. And pretty soon, Danville will be known for that. Martinsville has the opportunity, being a half hour west, of really doing something different and bringing advanced technologies, advanced manufacturing, in educating our children, creating a workforce pipeline. We stand with now the casino to the east to be that shining star uh, in Southside Virginia, rebuilding our economy, and I'm not giving up on that. I'll say one other part. I mentioned before, what are your intentions? The next thing I'll bring up, I want people to think about, when you're thrown some adversity, how do you respond? I know for a fact when these things started to be brought to your attention, you shut down just about everything going on in your life for two weeks to go back and start working on solutions to these problems. That's okay. how you responded. Yep. How did the casinos respond when we started winning in court? They doubled down, tripled down, and come after us with these pieces and these narratives and, and all that because that that shows how they're typically, uh, how they go about their business. So you responded in a way of, okay, here are the issues. How do we start to, um, to, to correct these issues and be stronger on the backside of it? Casinos say, oh, Sadler and Stanley, they, they won round one. Let's crush them in round two. Yep. 
Yeah. You know, let's not let's not be worried about what's right and what the judge said and what the Constitution says and all that. They are like, oh son of a, they got us now. We're gonna go back and get them. Yeah. You know, and so that that to me says a lot about them, but also says a lot about um, why we continue to hold our head high and fight because there are morals involved. There are things related to people's rights and things that how we handle ourselves now moving forward, it'll be repercussions from this and waves in the, in the water for years and years and years and years and years down the road, even after you and I are uh, long gone. So we can't stop. I mean, we cannot stop uh, no. because they're more powerful than we are. No. And it's, you know, it's not, it's like stopping living or giving in, throwing up your hands and saying, I quit. Okay. You get, you know, Please stop attacking me. If you go out into the field of battle and the field of ideas uh, in that public arena, then, of course, those things come up. That's why, you know, I always stress ethics and honesty and character and integrity. Those will carry you through honesty, especially because it won't be a problem. I always ha- try to create relationships with the press. Always give them an honest answer. Uh, don't play games with them. So, you know, if you do something wrong, hey, you know, look, you got to eat it. Um, but making something uh, situational, uh, that was caused by the pandemic that shut down this this higher ed center and we're trying to build our way back is suddenly somehow my fault or members of the board of directors fault uh, that was out of our hands out of our hands with the pandemic and the government shutdown of that school out of the executive director's hands out of the board members hands out of the employees hands and now that's suddenly uh, a big tax uh, debacle. I mean, you know, they were expecting me to, you know, be sitting up there making a quarter million dollars, <laughs> and I've got this, this, you know, little piece of the pie. And take because that's what I, that's what all them do. Yeah, that's what all them do. Yeah, you and know, so when they, they all get rich and fat, yeah. and you know, whatever. Uh, I will say one other thing. I know we want to get to a couple of uh, leaning right and a couple of turning left moments, but we we talk about unintended consequences and all the people involved in the small businesses in the skill game industry that nobody talks about. I guess today um, coming up later on the show is Justin Pence, who, who, who runs a small business in the Valley of, uh, of Virginia. And he's got a wife and a family. And, you know, we met, uh, we met, we met his wife and, and, and kid and stuff at the race at Motor Mile, you know, recently, but it just brings more focus to not only what these, you know, who these people are, but, the unintended consequences or the people that are negatively impacted by the casinos having the mindset that they do um, and, and not enough attention is brought to how normal everyday working people in their businesses and their families are being affected. And so today we'll introduce you to one of these people and his name is Justin Pence and he makes his living legally always has uh, in that industry. And he's like every, he's one of the hundreds of people that every time we go to court, he shows up to show his support for what we're fighting for because he realizes, like we do, that it's bigger than actually what we're fighting for now. We're fighting for rights and, and, and things that are that people are going to be fighting for for you know until the end of time. And so we, I look forward to introducing our listeners um, in the second part of this show today to Justin Pence, one of these guys and his families that's fighting right along with us in this fight for small business. Yeah, and I think it's great to, to listen to the viewpoints of these small business owners, of these people out there trying to make a living, trying to compete in a fair marketplace like this new emerging gaming industry. He has a lot of great things to say, I'm sure, and, and, and a lot of great perspective to give our listeners, and even maybe the legislators, uh, that this is a human issue. This is not some big, inanimate, uh, ornate issue. This is about lives and livelihoods of our small Virginia business owners. And we're going to, we're going to listen to one of them and, and we're going to definitely, I think, get a lot of knowledge and a great perspective on their fight every day and why we're fighting our fight for them as well. And so that's going to be a great interview. I can't wait uh, for the listeners to listen to it. It's, it's about America. It's about, you know, truth, justice, the American way. It's about free enterprise. And it's a really, Really good interview. Here's the other thing I want to at least briefly touch on, you know, because I, I had a kind of a tumultuous week. That's why we didn't throw one How out. How about this? How about this before you start? This? Sure, sure. You and I sit here and talk for 10 minutes before we start recording about what the bullet points are that we're going to talk about 
and the leaning right moment of the show, and we got to none of them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know that happens, you know, at, uh, more often than it should. But I think that's the natural part. Hey, I'm going to say something to you, too. And I'm going to thank this guy because, you know, we went a week without, and I'll explain it here um, in a minute. But so I was at the grocery store yesterday with my wife uh, doing our Sunday shopping and especially for the holidays coming up. And this guy comes around the corner. He's with his wife, really nice, you know, nice guy. And he screams, hey, I'm missing your podcast, you and Hermes podcast. And I said uh, to him, I'd never met him before. Is that my problem or your problem? Is that my fault or your fault? And he says, it's your fault. I said, I've listened to the last one. All my friends, we listened to the podcast. We love you guys. You're great. And we think, you know, I think you guys are really good together. I've listened to the candidate, the latest episode, but there was no, there was no episode that dropped this past Thursday. And I said, eh, I'm sorry, you know. And I explained to him exactly what was going on. But it was really nice to have some guy just in the general public uh, who who walked past me and started telling me that we needed to get back on the on the podcast because we were late. So thank you for that, uh, the the gentleman that told me that. I won't say his name, but he was a really really heck of a guy, and and so that that meant a lot to me and got me motivated. But we've had um, a couple issues, you know. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say this: what we talked about before for a little time, I'll admit, bummed me out when those articles started coming out. Because they were unfair and they weren't exactly, you know, in the context correct. And and yet you, Hermie, um, Hermie sent me a text that said, look, man, I understand if you got to do what you got to do, but I will never give up. And I, and I responded to you, Hermie, and I said, quitting ain't in my DNA either, buddy. Um, so it was good to get out there and, and do that. At the same time, uh, then, of course, we, we had uh, our old producer, uh, Chad Monday, Brad Tuesday. He was, uh, he was here for, geez about the first 41 podcast and, uh, and decided that, uh, he wanted to choose another career path, which of course, you know, he's 21 years old, young man was very good at this podcast recording stuff, but I, you know, he was in politics. He wants to be, I think in government administration, and that's a, probably a good role and good fit for him. And so being in a law firm, working for a law firm, also working for me as a, one of my legislative aides, just, you know, uh, probably was a, was a good experience, but not something you want to do long term. So we say a goodbye to Brad Tuesday, Chad Monday. We wish him well. Uh, but after that, then I had to find somebody who could run this equipment, and I found one. And it was not too far away from me. It's my son, my son Colin, Colin Hendrickson Stanley, uh, who who came forward and learned how to put this together so that we can record here today, get back on track. And put everything together. So we welcome a new producer. <laughs> My son is and also Colin. For the, for the for the times that I've been around him, his number one job, I thought just on the race team related stuff at the track, but now with the podcast, his, his job is to fix things that we and or us sometimes screw up. So <laughs> for that, I'm very thankful. That is affirmative. And then you know and and. You know, we're going to, I think we should do a podcast or our next podcast about fathers, but uh, just being dads, because it's so important to me. It's really changed my life. But he's like the most mature 21 year old I've ever seen. There was a time where we were in the kitchen when he was 19 and I handed him my keys. and was like, what's that for? I said, go wreck it. And he said, what? I said, go wreck my car. You've done nothing that I would have done bad as a 19 year old. But here we have uh, not only a, a young man who's a full time professional paramedic, uh, owns his own graphic, Eagle Graphics. Um, owns his own graphic and design company, which is great work with our, great. uh, with our hero cards and things of that nature. He with has. Saddle Stanley racing. He so has. Far as well. And now he's adding podcast producer to his, I mean, growing resume, but I'm so proud to be his father. I love him to death. And so we get to spend a little bit of time together. He works these like 24 hour shifts. So and we just make sure he understands, him. just make sure he understands he's not going to make any money. If we're going to have a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> I hadn't told him that part yet. <laughs> Still in negotiation. See if he could do it. Now you're ruining it. Okay. Uh, but we say goodbye to Chad Monday and wish him all the Plus well. Plus mileage. Plus mileage. No, we're not bringing Plus the mileage. friggin' mileage up again. That's probably part of the reason why Chad left. He sent me a thing saying, here, I want some reimbursements. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So uh, and my wife's like, no receipts, no reimbursements. So he's got to come up with some receipts. But uh, my sponsor standing up for what's right. I hear you. Yeah, well, my son just looked at me and said, you're a tax write-off. So there you go. He's writing me off on his taxes. <laughs> Uh, but we're, we're happy that he got this up and running and, and so we could come back to you. So uh, welcome aboard, Colin. This is going to be fun as father-son stuff. 
I'm looking forward to it. So um, kinda hit, we've kind of hit the reset button. So we it's have, all good. We have, and we, you know, we we plan about forty nine fifty shows a year. I mean, that's that's a lot of podcasts per year. Um, we think it's going to be exciting as we finish out the year as we're approaching the holidays. And in January, we're going to pump it back up because the General Assembly session comes back in. You know, you're running. Uh, we're going to be in Richmond. We're going we're gonna to pump out a lot of podcasts, I think, at that time, really looking at the General Assembly session, what it's doing, what it's not doing, what it should be doing. And so those are going to be fun as well. But we, we're going into the holidays here. And the week we missed was actually um, election week. And so in my Leaning Right moment, sponsored by Charlie's Waterfront Cafe in Farmville, Virginia, go to Charlie's, get a great meal, have great fun, say hi to Tom Graziano for us. Um, I was wondering what your take was on the outcome of the elections. I know, you know, and I don't remember, I have to ask you in the form of a question. <laughs> so, you know, all these polls at the end and all these pundits said, man, it's going to be a red, red wave, might even be a red tsunami. Might even be, I mean, it's just it's going to be Republican, Republican, Republican. And we go through election day, election night. I stay up late watching it, and I see maybe an election dribble, trickle, whatever. Um, go to bed, and, you know, a couple of issues. What do you think about what happened in the election, especially what was expected and then what occurred? And then more importantly, tell me why, what your opinion is, why the red wave didn't come about and what it means for the United States going forward? Question mark. Well, two things. <laughs> two things. Number one, I think Republicans coming down the stretch leading up to election day, I will say the last four to six weeks, I think got overconfident. Because if you watch TV and watch the news and all the bad things that were happening and inflation and, uh, uh, you know, wages going down and, uh, you know, uh, all the problems that that, uh, that uh, affect normal, everyday working people, you you watch TV on any station pretty much, and you had a pretty good idea of how bad things were. And so, but I, all of them told you, like, this is going to be a history-making flip or change in direction, and Republicans are going to win this and that and the other. And I think there are some, and at least some that I've talked to locally, because some of the races that we had here, only a few, we like the only thing I could vote for really, I voted for um, uh, our old friend, you know, Woody Harris has been on city council here in Emporia for years and years and years, passed away. So we uh, voted on a replacement for him for that. And then, you know, our uh, fourth district congressional race with Leon Benjamin, but that's, that's all we had. And I just think that a lot of people that I've talked to just, I got the impression from some of them that thought, Republicans were going to win all these races in a big landslide, and it it, it it wasn't really a whole lot else there for me to vote for. And I knew we, I, I felt like confident we were going to win, so I didn't vote. Hmm. So you know, uh, I, I think some of it had to do with, quite frankly, uh, just people making the bad mistake of not getting out to vote. And you just can't do that. You have to get out and, and vote. It's so important, regardless. Go vote for what you think is right, but please participate in the process, no matter the level, if it's the city council or if it's school board, all the way up to, you know, like next year coming up, statewide elections, all that, it's important for people to have their voice heard. And the other thing, Bill, that I, I, I've always believed that it's always in the back of some people's minds, I always, regardless of what people think and feel and what the temperature is heading into an election, I have a lot of faith in the American people. And I have a lot of faith in the residents of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I think more times than not, over time, they'll get it right and make the right decisions. Um, I think that a lot of people really and truly prefer, I'm not saying it's right, wrong, good, bad, prefer split government in some way. I think yeah. I think a lot of people would, would rather not give all the power to one side or the other. They would prefer to see, you know, both sides, whether it be liberals, conservatives, um, I think they'd like for both of them to have some representation and a seat at the table. Um, they, I think they think that, uh, I think they've seen what happened, what has happened if you give give the liberals too much power um, in a short period of time, a lot of things um, have gone sideways, some of which I don't know that we'll ever recover from, but certainly um, 
a lot of work has to be done. But I think some people just really prefer a split government. You know, that that tends to be true. And especially in this curtain, uh, certain, you know, scenario that we have in front of us, I think overconfidence was a, probably an issue for Republicans and, and that probably turned out less voters. You saw a lot more people um, motivated in trying to unseat Democrat incumbents. You saw higher Republican turnout there, uh, but not enough to get there. You saw some very positive things in terms of a larger percentage of Hispanics uh, were, were voting Republican, a larger, uh, larger part of, and percentage of African Americans were voting Republican. I think that's something you can take away with in messaging. But what I saw was a lot of toad cli- uh, candidates. I saw a lot of candidates that, you know, it's one thing to vote against somebody. You know, I'm going out to vote against somebody. What what you really want to have is to motivate people to go and vote for somebody. For. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, when you look at, let's just, as an example, the John Fetterman, Mehmet Oz, Dr. Oz um, race, the Senate race up in Pennsylvania, you know, there just wasn't a lot of motivation there for people to vote for Dr. Oz. He was, of course, inexperienced, but, you know, people didn't find a connection with him, even, even though he was on TV a lot. Uh, and maybe there was a connection there. You know, they didn't see a connection to Pennsylvania. Um, you know, he he was telling everybody to, you know, to do something, you know, like go out and vote on, you know, on, on early voting uh, after the Pittsburgh Steelers game when the Steelers were on a bye. You know, that matters to people a little bit. Um, you know, he starts, starts talking about a short trudery board. I mean, I can't even say the word, and I know it just has a lot of meat on it, uh, on on some uh, plate. But, you know, they didn't really identify with Mehmet Oz, and I think that cost him the election. And, and so you could run through a whole bunch of candidates that probably should not have been there. The other thing that I saw was Democrats in the primaries, if there was an extreme right-wing candidate, Democrats were going out in primaries for, probably for the first time and putting money into those campaigns to vote the kook in. And that way it made them easier to retain their seats. Uh, I saw some of that, which I hadn't seen before. Uh, if that's now uh, part of the playbook, it's really going to send uh, politics, and especially primary politics, into a into a, a tizzy, into a, a confusing world. But that may be the world we're living in. Um, Virginia, we gained one House seat uh, with uh, my friend Senator Jen Kiggins, is now a Congresswoman-elect Jen Kiggins. But we lost the Spanberger seat with Vega. She was, I thought, a pretty good candidate. Um Female Hispanic, former police officer, uh, Navy officer Cow lost to to Jennifer Wexton, so they retained those seats. But at one time they were saying, "Man, the tidal wave will start when you see all these uh, House uh, district seats turning." And of course, uh, Leon Benjamin, you know, it's a heavily Democrat area, so Don McEachin really didn't have a, you know, had a threat. But they thought that Spanberger and Wexton could be defeated, and you know, it wasn't as close as it should have been, and uh, and those Democrats retained their seats. Congratulations to Kiggins. Took out Elaine Loria, the Democrat. Increases our Republican uh, representation to uh, by one. Uh, now, uh, moving forward, though, we've got, what, a two-seat major- two majority in the House. Republicans do. That's really not a majority you can hold on to because two defectors go over to the Democrats on any one governmental initiative, and, um, and your majority has gone away. Kevin McCarthy is trying to become speaker. He can't get to 218. You have to have 218 votes from the whole Congress in order to become speaker. He's got some rebellion on the other side there or in his own side right there. Um, I I just I think you're right to to respond to what you said about 10 minutes ago before I started talking. But, you know, that is that is nothing more than I think a doorstop to stop some of the crazy stuff that was happening with single party politics in the House, the Senate in the United States uh, presidency in the same way that, you know, Youngkin's um, election and the House election, which was, again, two seat majority in the House of Delegates, was a way to stop um, the crazy liberal policies that were going when it was Northam, a Democrat Senate and Democrat House of Delegates. Uh, it, it, it may be good to have split government, but a split government never always gets much done. That's right. And how, how will... You know, you mentioned um, Jen Kiggins, who I went down to her event election night um, to uh, to to be with her and and George Allen and Glenn Davis and some other people that were down there that night. So 
there's already been a special election call to replace her spot into in, in the Virginia Senate, which could be important too as well. How, how do, what do you know about that? Or when would that be? Or yeah, I didn't mean to spring that on you. Cause I just, I was, uh, watching and, and, you know, watching online kind of when, when Keegan's won and then they started to have some conversation about, you know, I, I guess, uh, Louise Lucas and governor Yunkin had to agree on time and parameters or whatever the case may be on what, uh, when and how they, uh, they, uh, pick a replacement for Kiggins who's vacated that seat. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually we have, it does not look like there'll be a primary, um, fight. Kevin Adams is the, uh, gentleman who's been, who's going to be the Republican nominee, African-American gentleman, former military, all around great guy. Everybody in, in the Virginia beach Senate district, uh, that was Jen Kiggins should go out there, support him, give him money. I'm going to send him a little cash. Um, and, and, and support him. He's got a special election, Hermie, which is kind of almost exactly like mine. Uh, Robert Hurt was elected to Congress uh, in 2010. Uh, when he was elected, then a special election to fill his last year of his Senate uh, term, uh, right, at, right before redistricting, uh, was set. And that's when I ran it. But I ran in a primary with six or eight people. And then the, the general special election was the night before, the day before, uh, you went back to general assembly session. So I, you know, ended up when I won and was honored to win. I drove up there, got there at four o'clock in the morning, got sworn in and there was the first day of school. Um, he's got the same thing going on. His election is going to be the day before we go in. I think that's uh, January 10th will be his election. So everybody get out there and, and help. Uh, they're running a, a Senate Democrat candidate against him. Um, so it certainly is not uh, a challenge. It's going to be a challenge that he's got to, to do. And a lot of people aren't thinking about elections, Hermie. In January, uh, and so getting people up off the couch, motivated to vote. Again, you got to be motivated to vote for somebody. Uh, is a little tougher way to go. The vote count is a lot lower than a normal general election would be in November. Plus, he's fi- finishing out the seat of Jen Kiggins. That is, it is in its old form. So then, the next year is that Senate seat has been changed and transformed through redistricting. So he'll have the same challenges that I had, and hopefully, I can give him some good advice. But we need. We need Kevin in the Senate. We need to maintain right now it's 2119 in favor of Democrats. Uh, I think 2218 makes it even worse for us. So we need to retain that Senate seat, especially when we're going into the 2023 elections uh, where we're trying to get the majority of the Senate back. But uh, he's a good guy. He's going to be a great candidate. And I hope everybody gets out there to, to get him. But, you know, these are elections that not a lot of people are thinking about in January, Herm. Yeah, we got to get people motivated to to get out and, and, as you say, vote for someone or something and not necessarily against someone or something, uh, which has proven to be not so good in the past. You got time for, uh, I think I've got something pretty special for turning left yeah. I'd like to tell you about. Well, let's, let's end my Leaning Right moment, sponsored by Charlie's Waterfront Cafe. Uh, we are actually recording uh, today in the beautiful offices of Vista Installations, which I believe is your turning left sponsor. Is it not for this for this moment? Vista Installation is an award-winning window and door installation company operated by my sponsor <laughs> of the turning left moment, Laura Stanley. She has been babysitting trial attorneys and legislators, her <laughs> words, not mine, for well over 12 years. And we're Thankful to have Laura Stanley and Vista Installations as the sponsor of the Turning Left Moment on Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. So we want to give everybody an update, uh, Bill, about Sadler Stanley Racing. I met over the past weekend, uh, had a, a meeting with Phil Stefanelli down at PSR Products, who we're lucky enough to have not only building and preparing our race cars, but doing the maintenance on them, housing the cars, taking care of them, and and, and getting them ready for the uh, 2023 season. You know, we had a little, even though Ryan Newman came home third at Martinsville, we, we dinged up a couple of our cars, and mm-hmm. so we've had to get some cars fixed and get things back up to snuff, ready to go uh, for the 2023 season. But I wanted to make a couple updates slash announcements um, and we're giving, you know, giving some news here on the podcast. We'll be following up with 
press releases and things this week. But are you ready to to kind of start having a conversation about 2023? Yeah, man, I'm I'm already bummed. I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, after the last race in Phoenix, um, I don't know what to watch on TV. I'm not big on college football. I can't watch the Washington Redskins or whatever their new name is, although they're winning, and maybe that's a good thing that I'm not watching. That's why they're winning. I'm always superstitious about that. There's nothing to to watch. I'm I'm, I'm in a blue funk that you know that there's no racing on TV and we don't have any races going on for the SSR racing and the smart series or the Wheeland modified racing. I have now resorted to going on my flow app, flow racing app and watching rewatching all of our old races with my son Chandler. So I am, I am craving, craving some racing news, buddy. And lay it on me, big daddy. What you got? Announcement. Number one is we have officially now, well, let me say this first. This past year, we ran one full-time car with Jonathan Brown in the Smart Series, and then we ran a second car part-time with we had Jonathan uh, we had Jonathan Cash, we had Ryan Newman, obviously the big win at North Wilkesboro. We had Bobby Labani uh, join us in the second car uh, at Martinsville last fall. But moving to 2023, our first full-time driver that we're going to announce, and we're both proud of this one, we have officially signed NASCAR Hall of Famer Bobby Labonte to drive the first Sadler Stanley racing car full-time in the Smart Series and in selected events in the NASCAR Wheeling Modified Tour starting in 2023. So that makes me and you happy. It's certainly going to make your son Chandler happy. Uh, that he can actually wear the same shirt and have Sadler Stanley Racing, Pace Matic, and Bobby Labonte on the same shirt. Yeah, amen, brother. I mean, you have probably, with this great, great deal that you've worked out, um, you've made my peace in the Valley. You've made peace in my family. Um, it's nice to, you know, I invested a lot of my hard-earned cash into Bobby Labonte merchandise when he was running for cookout and another team. Uh, my son wears that sweatshirt every day to school uh, we have to wash a lot uh and now uh let me tell you when he found out that uh, you'd signed bobby labani to our team he did a happy dance he was just jumping up and down for joy uh, bobby's a consummate professional a true gentleman uh we've gotten to know him from racing this year and and when we've gone to the owner's lot for for bringing our RVs in there. There he is with his beautiful wife, Kristen. She's joining the team. She's going to be handling a lot of our PR, man. This is so exciting. And that's just car number one that we're going to have Hall of Famer Bobby Labonte running with us, man. I cannot yeah. wait. And well, I'm going to buy merchandise that's going to have our – I'm going to buy merchandise, Bobby Labonte merchandise that has SSR, Sadler Stanley Racing, on it. And what number is he going to run? Is he going to run the 22 that we ran last year? Or is he this. Running? I'm going to show you this right here. I got a T-shirt design that just came in. Oh, wow. From Kristen Labani. We don't want to ruin it for you, but that's a T-shirt that I think everybody's going to want to get. That That's awesome. That's our car with, and it looks like he's going to run again in the fam- in the number that he made famous, the 18. That's awesome. 18 VA will be the number on the car. We're, not, we're working at the details with NASCAR on what number we'll run on the car for the tour races, but for the smart tour Races. Bobby Labonte is going back to his roots, driving the number 18, the number that he had so, so much success in, and uh, which eventually put him in the Hall of Fame. 18 V8 will be the number for Bobby Labonte uh, in that car. And what I'm also going to tell people, and we'll be updating as we move forward, maybe, maybe in the next week or two, uh, hopefully before we get to Christmas is the goal um, to, to finalize car two. But in 2023, we're going to run two full-time cars yep. at every smart tour event and selected NASCAR wheeling modified tour races. So uh, Bobby Labonte, that's car number one. He's uh, he's full-time uh, 2023 from start to finish. We, you and I had a conversation last night about yep. um, we've got, which is, which speaks well about our team. We've got a handful of drivers at least that are, talking to us that have shown interest and want to join Sadler Stanley Racing uh, for 2023. So we have yet to make those decisions and finalize that uh, we're going to take our time and make sure that we look at all the 
possible scenarios. It really boils down for us. Um, I know for me, and I think for you too, is the camaraderie and the unity of the team mm -hmm. is very, very important. We need somebody that's going to, you know, um, you know, understand the dream work. Team works makes the dream work kind of kind of <laughs> deal. Um, so we we'll keep everybody updated here on the podcast over the next two or three weeks about exactly what our decision making process will be. We we've not made a final determination on Jonathan Brown yet, and there are a couple of people out there. Uh, I've certainly given Jonathan Brown the ability to go look at other opportunities. Didn't think that was fair for him to wait on us, but it's a lot of a lot of parts and pieces that have to go together um, in a in a two car team situation. That if you don't have the right uh, the right chemistry, uh, it can be detrimental. So we're having conversations about all that, and and, and again, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll make some decisions. But the, the good news is Bobby Labani is is signed up, ready to go, and we will be a two car team all across the board next year. And so a lot of work behind the scenes is going on to get us ready to do that. And we'll update everybody on the second driver uh, in the next two or three weeks. Yeah, and, that, and that's great. You know, he's getting into some high-end equipment. Uh, you know, you have not spared a dime on making sure that we had the best engines and we had the best chassis. We had the best crew working on them. Uh, we've always made that determination since the very beginning is that we wanted to win, we wanted to compete, wanted to get our message out, use it as a platform, but also wanted to have a great time, wanted to have fun. And I think he brings all of that to the table. Uh, our our entry last year came in sixth in season points, one point away from a top five season championship finish. Um, had a couple of tough breaks right there at the end, or we would have been probably one of the top three uh vehicles uh, race cars coming into the championship race uh, there at the motor mile for the smart series so i'm feeling even better about what we're going to do next year with a great guy um great wheel man and uh and i think we're gonna we're gonna not only be, be competitive but we're gonna have a great time doing it and certainly he's a great spokesman for everything uh, that he stands for and i think we'll be a great a great ambassador for pacematic uh, for cookout and other, you know, other sponsors that are that are coming on board with the car. So that's really exciting. That second car deal, man. We got more to, we got more to do. I've I've heard some names that, you know, these are legends that want to drive your car, drive our car, um, and so I'm excited just about how that unfolds as as we move forward. But, you know, we had a really good race here from the beginning. I mean, barely under a year, we we did, I think, more than we ever expected to do. So the expectations are there. But I think you said it earlier, you know, we have a handful of drivers that now want to drive for us based on what we did on the first year. And I want to credit you uh, and you and Phil Stefanelli for what you guys put together in such a short period of time. I was just, you know, the guy would show up in an RV and, with his family and have a great time and, and get to know everybody and, and watch the races. You really put on a hell of a performance putting this team together and then having it be as successful as it was this year with the promise of it being more successful in the future. So kudos to you, my friend. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we just like we talked about earlier with everything that we do, there's always things we could wish we could go back and do different or change or had different outcomes or whatever. But ultimately the car had what we wanted it to have. And that was speed pretty much all year. You know, we won pretty early on at Franklin County, Ryan Newman, you know, with Jonathan Brown and Ryan Newman won hands down the biggest race of the year. Uh, for an open wheel modified anywhere in the country was that race back at North Wilkesboro first time since 1996. Yep. And Ryan Newman took the checkered flag for that race. Nope. I mean, that, that was the moment of the year and the win of the year in any kind of modified. And then we followed that up, you know, Newman came back and got a, a third place finish at Martinsville, a uh, big step for our team. We hadn't run a whole lot of wheeling tour races, so that was good. And I was really proud at how we finished, the season with Jonathan Brown at Motor Mile, you know, qualified great, led, you know, led a majority of the race and ended up with a, with a, with a solid P2 finish to close out the smart tour season, you know, uh, at Motor Mile. So that showed even through the challenges and the ups and the downs and, and all that, that our team still put a car on the track that was capable uh, of winning. And we, we were very fast at Motor Mile. Yeah. So we've had speed and we'll continue to build on that and, and work towards, um, filling in the the holes of what we you know the shortcomings we had last year and and try to try to get our car in victory lane uh, a little more often in 2023. 
I'm looking forward to it. Um, first race is what in March, March or April? Yeah, March. Yeah, yeah I look. I don't have the schedule in front of me, but but I do know the, they start at March, and there's a week, there's a tour race pretty early on uh, in, starting as well. So we're planning uh, the schedule, you know, for all of that and working behind the scenes on merchandise and you know pit crew stuff and all that. That's what you know the meeting the feeling I had yesterday, trying to kind of get on the same page as far as all that. So things are in motion. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're fortunate to have a, a driver, uh, like Bobby Labonte that wants to join our team. That's great for us. Brings a lot of credibility to our team and to our sponsors and, and all that. And, and, uh, now we'll button up everything on the second car and, and, uh, hopefully by Christmas have everything signed and done and ready and start working and testing. We've already got some test dates planned, uh, with Bobby to, to get him out there and get him, get him used to our team and our cars and, and all that. And so, uh, 20. 23 is looking is looking bright for Saddle Stanley Race. It is. It is. I can't wait. And I know it will go better than this podcast will. I, I'm guaranteed you will this not podcast have has been great. Oh, I know, but we've had some hiccups here and there. So, you know, I'm just, um, you've done a I very good job. I thought you meant job. this particular episode. <laughs> no, no, but, it, you know, who knows? We still have minutes left. It could turn south very quickly. And then what we have to make sure we've done is that we've recorded this and that we can download it safely to Podcast Heat, our friends, uh, over there, podcast heat. I, I, I just want to, you know, I know this is not turning left, but Jeff Jarrett back out wrestling again. I saw, you know, you said that? something. Yeah, I mean, he was wrestling like Sting or something, wasn't he? He wrestled Sting uh, this past Saturday night at the AEW Full Gear Pay Per View uh, up in New Jersey. Packed house. They, had, I talked to Jeff during the day on Saturday, and they had like over a million dollar gate. Uh, wow at the box office for that, for that event. But the cutest picture I showed you, somebody showed a video of Jeff walking backstage before the match and Cody right along with him, walking yeah. along with him. You know, I know Cody was just, you know, tickled to death uh, to be there, but uh, I don't know what Jeff, I know Jeff plans to be with AEW long-term. I'm not sure how much he, how long he plans to actual, to actually wrestle, but uh, they put on a great show. He and Sting have a lot of history over the years and uh, they put on a great show. I talked to people that were there live and talked to people that watched the pay-per-view, but I thought it was cool that uh, he was sharing all that with Cody because you know, Cody uh, really loves that. Yeah. And for those that uh, need to be reminded, uh, Cody uh, took away the undefeated status of our man, Hermie Sadler. Here we go. And the match we go. of a lifetime. You can see that. Uh, you can uh, see that you can actually, you can see it on uh, YouTube, but you can listen to it. And us going over the play-by-play -play on undefeated, Hermie Sadler, undefeated, no more. And uh, that was a great thing. But that was a great picture seeing Cody. Cody, of course, has special needs. And what a wonderful guy and what a wonderful relationship you've got with him as well. I've got one question, though. AEW, is that new? I mean. No, it's uh, all elite wrestling. I'm going to say it's uh, probably three years old. It's owned by Tony Khan, uh, same guy that owns the Jacksonville Jaguars, um, and he owns a hockey team and he's, um, he's certainly in a different financial bracket than you and I are Senator. Clearly, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Cause you know, he was with the WWE, um, yeah. Jeff was, and then that of course ended. And then here he is at AEW. I, I'm exec. I'm he's guessing been talking he... to the people at AEW for quite some time. Oh, is that right? Just had to wait for the right time to, you know, to pull the trigger. They, I think Jeff is more interested longer term in a, you know, in a backstage managerial type position, working with international business and, and, and live events. And that's what he really loves. But I think to Jeff's credit, uh, Tony Khan and those folks really want him to come in and wrestle some first. They realized looking back to the Ric Flair last match at how good a shape Jeff was in and how oh, hard yeah. he had worked to get ready for that match. And so they did a little something with him and Sting and, and he and he and Sting have a lot of history you know, in, in, in the industry over the years. So it was fun, but, but again, I, I just thought of all the pictures and all the videos and stuff, seeing Cody, he was strutting around backstage, you know, like he owned the place. And I yeah. just think that's awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, it really doesn't matter who won the match, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because you know, Cody being there is the best part, but who won the match? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? I don't know. Oh, okay. Cause I mean, you got double J and I Sting. You to go watch the pay-per-view. I guess I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to spend the money. All right. Well, I just wanted to check that out. So we're going to take a break here. 
And then we're coming back with small business owner, Virginia small business owner, Justin Pence. He's going to discuss with us what's it like to be a small business owner, that the travails of being a small business owner, the ups, the downs, especially through the pandemic, and even the role that skill games have played in the success of his business as well. So uh, we're going to come back and, and have that great interview. So listen to our sponsors, of course, because we have to pay for what we do here, and we're very grateful for the sponsors we have. But you know what? You know what, Herm, before we get off, I've got one sponsor <laughs> you might not know about. <laughs> or maybe you do. I do. And I now, do. now that it's the holidays, our friends at Manscaped, who have been great sponsors with us, uh, have they're at it again. They're at it with witty uh, advertising, and I have the privilege and honor of reading it since Hermie says he won't. Uh, but that doesn't mean he does not support Manscaped. And I'm going to say I have all the Manscaped products. My boy Colin has all the Manscaped products. We swear by him. But ladies and gentlemen, tis the season for clean balls. Fa la 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 la. Wait a minute. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should sing that. I'm going to start over. Tis okay. the season for clean balls. Fa la 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 la. There you go. That was better, right? Our friends at Manscaped are helping you clear your driveway for safe travels this holiday season. From stocky stuffers to white elephants, Manscaped's products are at the top of every wish list. Grab some crop mops for your pops or the body buffer for the holiday lover. <laughs> win, win this year's white elephant gift and help all the men in your life go from eggnog to nice hog. Oh, boy. This December by going to manscaped.com and using promo code did you, Sadler. Did you not, did did you not, not pre-read that? I before? did not pre-read this at all. <laughs> That's right. Go to manscaped.com and use promo code Sadler at checkout to receive 20% off your order. Your total order, I'm telling you, the big order you're making plus free shipping. I'm telling you right now, um, I've got, you know, I've ordered some Manscaped 4.0 premium platinum package for some of my friends uh, who, are, when they open up that Christmas gift, they're just going to be like, man, Stanley, how did you know? How did you know I need, need a little Manscaped? And I'm going to say, I didn't know. I just took a wild guess. See, this is where you typically get in trouble when you start doing this ad living. So right, okay, but you know you can you can go to manscape.com whether it's a gift like the premium package 4.0 or hey stocking stuffers. You know how you like to stuff your stockings with this kind of stuff, so why not try it? They've got their handful of liquid uh, formulations, shampoo, body washes. I use those every morning. Uh, they got the upstairs deodorant, the downstairs deodorant for you. They got gels, exfoliants, razors, shavers. Nose trimmers, everything you want is right there for you at manscaped.com. Don't let their chestnuts chestnuts roast in the wrong boxers. You can even get underwear, a pair of Manscaped boxers. Those are specially made to keep the that area cool and dry and provide holiday comfort all year round. Uh, you can do the shears, the, the preserve, and they've now got a cologne. They've got a body spray uh, that my, uh, uh, my wife's, uh, manager here, her husband swears by the body spray. Uh, you can, they've even got a body buffer. This is a new product. If you're using a loofah, try the body buffer. Uh, loofahs usually hold bacteria from dead skin. Throw out that old loofah and try the body buffer. It's going to make your skin soft and tone, and your wife or girlfriend will thank you for it. And lastly, don't forget to top off the stocking stuffers uh, with the crown jewel for the family jewels, the lawnmower 4.0. The electric razor's advanced skin-safe technology is a life changer and known for reducing nicks and cuts uh, and on Santa's sack. I didn't read that either beforehand, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Manscaped is here to make holiday shopping a blast by giving products they'll love and make them laugh. And certainly when they write this stuff, they're making me laugh and they make you laugh with me having to read it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to remind you one more time. Manscaped.com. Go to Manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with promo code SADDLER. When you go on and order their products, that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. And, and every time you enter the promo code, you will get that 20% discount and you will get that free shipping as well. So what's use the, what's the promo code again? Promo code. I'm glad you asked. The promo code is Sadler, S A D L E R. <laughs> Not Stanley. Don't put in Senator. Don't put in Stanley. Put in your boy Hermes, Sadler. Put in Sadler <laughs> at checkout. Promo code. Get that 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Manscaped for a perfect gift that will be the holiday's biggest hit or a good laugh at the same time right around the Christmas tree. Thank you, Manscaped.com. All right. Thank you for everything you do for this show. We appreciate your sponsorship and support of us. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take another break so you can hear one more commercial. Hopefully it's just as funny. And, uh, and we'll be right back with Justin Pence. Hi, folks. This is Hermie Sadler. Thanks for listening to our all-new podcast, Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I hope you are enjoying the show as much as Senator Stanley and I enjoy bringing it to you. Whether you're a family traveling together or a truck driver hauling freight up and down the highway, I hope you will take the time to visit one of our Sadler Travel Plaza locations in Virginia and North Carolina. Sadler Travel Plaza locations are licensed dealer locations for pilot travel centers. And we also carry Shell Motiva Petroleum products for our four-wheel friends. We pride ourselves on providing one-stop shopping for service, food, and entertainment. Our food options include Five Guys Burgers and Fries, Quiznos, Dairy Queen, Hermie Sadler's Faux Show Bar and Grill, Victory Lane Restaurant, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, and much, much more. Our locations include Sadler Travel Plaza in South Hill, located off I-85 at Exit 12. The Sadler Travel Plaza of Emporia, which is conveniently located on Exit 11D off I-95. And Sadler Travel Plaza on Highway 58 in Suffolk. We also have our North Carolina location, Sadler Travel Plaza in Dunn, North Carolina. That's Exit 75 off I-95. We appreciate all of our customers. And Bill and I appreciate you listening to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pace of Hey, this is Bill Stanley, Hermie Sadler's sidekick on this podcast. When I'm not in Richmond at the Capitol or doing this podcast, my real job for the past 27 years is as a trial attorney with the Stanley Law Group. Here at the Stanley Law Group, we represent our clients in every courthouse in the Commonwealth. No problem is too small for us to solve. No case is too big for us to win. Whether it's criminal charges, traffic offenses, civil disputes, litigation matters of any sort, we handle it all. We make sure that we treat every client like family because they are to us. Your problem is our problem. Your success is our success because we hate to lose more than we love to win. And believe me, we win a lot. Don't believe me? Go ask Hermie. I'm his favorite lawyer and he hates lawyers. So give us a call at 540-721-6028 and let us help you. Or visit our website at www.vastanleylawgroup.com. That's www.vastanleylawgroup.com. At the Stanley Law Group, we'll make sure we're the lawyers that you swear by and not at. And we're back. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, still leaning right. I'm former NASCAR driver and Fox Sports analyst Hermie Sadler, and I am turning left. Once again, leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the Senator is powered by Pacematic. What's up? What's up? Well, it's guest time. It is guest time. And, Senator, as you know, one of the things that we've always done, in fact, one of the initial reasons for us doing this podcast on a weekly basis was to have a platform to keep our fight for small business on the front pages, on the front lines, in everybody's minds. and Top of the conversation. Top of the conversation mm-hmm. for everybody because we are in truly, uh, we are truly fighting for the lives of small businesses in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, 90% of the time, it's me and you talking about it and our involvement in it. I'm a small business owner. You are representing us in a lawsuit uh, as, uh, as, as, a, as our attorney. Mm-hmm. And, but once in a while, it's a good idea to bring a guest in that is also impacted by what the Commonwealth of Virginia has tried to do to small businesses with this skill game ban and how small business owners have been impacted by the success we've had in court so far. And today is one of those days because our guest today, Senator, is, is Justin Pence, who uh, has been involved. I'll let him tell his story um, but has been involved uh, in the skill game industry uh, for quite some time and has ridden this roller coaster with us uh, the entire time. So, Justin, welcome to the show. Um, we're excited to hear your story and, and about your company and your family and kind of what you've experienced as we've been through this process and the lawsuit as well. But tell us who you are, where you're from, and exactly how is your business involved in the skill game industry? Thank you, Mr. Sadler and Senator. Uh, it's great to be with you. I have um, uh, my small business is located in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, uh, in the heart of the Shenandoah Valley in Woodstock, and we have about seven employees, 
two full-time, five part-time employees that work all local people that live right in our community. Um, we operate games in convenience stores and truck stops, and we were started right when the truck stops were allowed to have games in Virginia, the Queen of Virginia. We've always been only Queen of Virginia. Um, we've started with the truck stops, and then they moved to where we could add um, machines in convenience stores, and that was our, our basis. We had a lot of connections in convenience stores, and we kind of blew up when we were allowed to put them in convenience stores, and we, I think, have uh, probably 75 locations uh, within a 75-mile radius of, of the Shenandoah Valley, so um, it's it's been great for us. Uh, we, we've fought, uh, we've been to all the, the hearings that you all have done, all the court cases, the um, I'm awesome, aren't I? <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah, you do good. Thank you. Uh, Thank we, you. we were uh, Stanley Law Group seven two one six zero two eight for all your trial needs. <laughs> we were shut Keep down, talking, Mr. Pence. You're great. <laughs> <laughs> we were shut down for the six months that uh, the whole state was, and uh, we've abided by every rule that there is, and and it helps um, small business. I mean, all the money that we make stays in our community. All the stores that that I have games in. That they're all local owners in the state of Virginia, in you know, in my county, my neighbors, that that have the businesses and and make money from them. So, um, it it seems just like common sense to me to keep these games going and and keep these businesses going. So, well, and it's it's not only important uh, to keep these games going, but I'm sure you're also seeing where some of your convenience stores are seeing other places of business having illegal games of chance, video games of chance that are going on, and we need to eradicate those while we keep the skill games and the good, fair, and just skill games uh, operating. I think in our mind, the, the we need to pay some sort of tax. We need to be regulated. We need to be um, pay our, share fair, our fair share, and we all want to. Uh, and so there, there is some kind of oversight on all these games because it's, it's just we have so many locations that they've just – made undesirable locations because of bringing illegal games in and games of chance and um, it, it gives us all a black eye well and, and not only that it doesn't you know those games aren't fair you know with a skill game you have the chance of winning every time you play based on your skill those games of chance are usually rigged against the player it's much like the casinos where the house always wins uh, and so you just don't know what kind of product you're getting like when you see a, a Queen of Virginia skill game, you see what you're getting. You know what you're getting. It's a skill game. It's been inspected by the Attorney General. It's been inspected by the ABC. It's been determined not to be a game of chance. They know the inner workings, the outer workings of these games. And people love to play them. And the thing that I see the most is, and, and talk to us about a little bit of the regulation and oversight that we had with ABC, was when the ABC during that one year was regulating skill games in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We call it the yellow sticker period. They registered with the ABC. They were only in ABC establishments. They had to have the yellow sticker on them. I thought that was a great enforcement mechanism that everything worked out pretty well. What were your thoughts about how the ABC handled it? It was great. We never had any issue. Um, within our own company, we, we made sure every game had a sticker. We made sure everything was right. And it kept the undesirable people out because it was easy to see if you didn't have that um, 6 by 10 yellow sticker on there. It, it wasn't a legal game. And uh, like Senator Stanley said, people like the Queen of Virginia. People prefer to play that because they know it's fair and they know that they have a good chance of winning. And uh, that's uh, people, people prefer it. You know, I was glad to hear you talk a little bit about your business and not only your business, your company, but the convenience stores and their employees and their families all are involved and have been riding this roller coaster, as I described it, up and down as the Commonwealth of Virginia has tried to target these specific type of games and ban them from the Commonwealth of Virginia because Bill and I have had this conversation through the whole process. It seems like to me that when some of these legislators get approached or you know, let's just be honest, the casinos, the, the casinos and their lobbyists and their investors, and they have a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of influence. And it seems like when they come in there and start talking about skill games, some people seem to think that it's it's only, you know, like one person in a skill game or maybe a manufacturer of a game that they're going after. 
that they don't like, they don't really take the time to think, to your point, that when you try to unconstitutionally ban a game, you're not just hurting the manufacturer of the game. You're hurting the distributor of the game. You're hurting the retail location that legally and correctly operates the game and the revenue that that has been for convenience stores like mine and, and others across the Commonwealth of Virginia, the people that play the game, you know, not everybody can afford to, you know, jump in the car, or a husband, a wife for the weekend and, and drive to a casino somewhere. They don't have those kind of discretionary funds. And so there, there are a lot more people negatively impacted by what the government has been trying to do to these games. And I think most people realize. Well, and I think we can coexist with casinos. I think we we can operate skill games and convenience stores and casinos can operate all in the same environment. Uh, there's nobody that says, I'm going to go to the Quickie Mart and play. I'm not going to go to the casino. It's it's two different demographics of people, I believe. And uh, back to your, to your um, saying about the games and how they help, all through the pandemic, um, one of our biggest customers has probably 100 convenience stores. The, the stores had trouble paying the rent. And with these games, when they were operating, it helped the stores be able to pay their rent and, and keep the cycle flowing through, you know, all the bills were paid, employees were paid, nobody was laid off, and, and it, it really helped. And, and I, don't know, uh, I don't know why the people can't see that. You know, they, when you start talking business to some of these people, like at the same time they're trying to ban these games, also minimum wage – Yep. gone up cost of goods gone up so now they tell us we have to pay an employee that we know nothing about twelve dollars an hour to start that means a good solid dependable honest employee that's been with us a couple of years we got to make 14 15 that means shift managers got to make 17 18 you know it, it pushes all that up so at the same time they're saying okay we mandate what you're paying to your employees it's put us in a position where we've had to, in some cases, reward bad behavior for employees. But your cost of goods are up. Your electric bill is up. All these things are up. And by the way, we're going to take away this part of your income, not because you lost it, but because we, we're going to take it and give it to a casino, which a majority of those people involved in those things and the investors are out of state that are coming in, you know, Chicago and Vegas and other places and 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 just taking that business that they didn't earn all we're asking for is a level playing field and i think that's the message that we've been able to um able to to, to harp in on during this lawsuit you know bill told me when we started there were other people that tried to go to court and get things done related to the skill game issue but it's basically they just all ran to the courthouse one day and said you know y'all are discriminating against us we're you know, we're minority owners of convenience stores, and we're not being treated correctly. Fix this. And Bill and I, from the get-go, never thought, thought one second about that strategy. Our strategy was, here's the law. It's unconstitutional, not to mention unfair. We've got to, brick by brick, you know, from the bottom up, foundation up, build a lawsuit that is going to actually work in a court of law and that's what we've been able to do for the for the entire time that's right and i think um you know we 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 have this fight it's going to be an ongoing fight in in the law right now it's going to continue to be an ongoing fight uh just like it's going to be a fight to fight this music that now has come on while we're taping uh we've got a squeaky chair and uh and some john Con john cougar mellencamp um but we're trying to put yeah. us in a better mood yeah yeah it's loud authority, radio, man. authority always wins that almost should be our theme song and we're fighting authority right now Authority, authority always wins. I'm telling you right now, what we've got to be thinking about, though, is uh, ultimately we, we think the courts are going to determine that these games are different than your slot machines, than your video slot machines. They're not games of chance. And games of skill have been allowed and continue to be allowed in so many different forms in the Commonwealth of Virginia. But the way that they're trying to actually get rid of what they think are scuzzy video skill games what they end up doing is removing Ski Ball and, and Galaga and Miss Pac Man. And, and it's really about the interaction of the player to the game and the fairness of the game. 
something you don't find when you walk through the doors of a Rosie's or, or a casino because, you know, blackjack's a game of chance. Uh, those video slot machines are games of chance. Uh, that's not what you have at your convenience stores. You have that opportunity, like I said earlier, to win every time. Let's just turn up a little bit more. Come on. I think we can get <laughs> higher than this. At least it's a good song. Yeah. It's not some of that new music that them kids are listening to. Yeah. Well, and also the money that we make, uh, us operators like myself and Pacematic and um, the convenience stores, a lot of it goes back into the communities. I know I'm able to help different organizations. I'm able to do different charity events. And and so are Pacematic and, and you know, I'm sure, Mr. Sadler, you, you do a lot yeah. of charity events too. And, mm-hmm. and this money that you make from these games helps you do that. One of the biggest things that – We've had to fight, and we continue to fight. For some reason, reasons that I don't didn't understand when we filed the lawsuit, and I still don't understand now, the skill game industry, for some reason, has like a like a negative uh, vibe in the General Assembly. In other words, they they talk about you know when, to some legislators, and not all. When you bring up the term skill games, they kind of just turn their nose up like it's like we're somehow second class citizens or some way, shape or form. You've been one that's been out in the trenches really, uh, you know, doing this. Do, do you get that feeling or sense in the time you spent in Richmond lobbying? And if so, why do you think that is? I don't know why it is, but I, I do feel it's it's kind of disheartening that that we don't have a better reception because we're 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 all good people all everybody that i've met involved with it is a great person and thank we, you we all want to do <laughs> thank you we all want to do the right thing we all want to we want to pay taxes not often do people say that but we we have said it over and over again we want to pay taxes we want to be involved in the communities and and we are getting um besides mr stanley we we get a poor reception from a lot of people mm-hmm. uh and oh you should <laughs> i'm in your group i get a poor reception in a lot of different places so we could talk about but that it has for been another something podcast. we've been fighting from the beginning is is some type for some reason it's a it's a stigma that follows you know how this industry is looked upon and that's one thing that bill and i've talked about just about every day and a lot of what my focus has been on during the lawsuit is to trying to put the white hat on the skill game industry because look i i i know these people i deal with them we have stores in our locations and i know the people that play them and I just don't see even Alan Joseph is a cool guy. Yeah, yeah, mostly. But you know, so that's one thing we've really worked hard on is trying to change the narrative about how people in the General Assembly look at this industry. Well, and not only that though, you, what we're seeing now is skill was much different than games of chance. Games of chance never were an issue when they banned skill games and they banned the regulatory oversight by the ABC. What we did with SB nine seventy one, the bill that we've challenged where we have the injunction where the skill games are now uh, turned back on. What they did was they opened the door, as we said before, to a proliferation of these games of chance, VGTs, video game terminals. Not a skill game, not even close to a skill game. Well, guess what they're doing right now? The casino lobby, the, the people that are up against you, have all now grouped those video game terminals, those games of chance, as now skill games, uh, which is a misnomer, and not only a misnomer, an injustice, uh, to what we've been fighting for. But they're now, they, since they couldn't dirty us up by what we were able to establish in the law through the first court case, now they're trying to dirty you up by putting you with the other highly illegal games and just saying everything's a skill game. And those are not skill games. They just want to be able to go to court next time we go to court and say, Judge, you gave these people an injunction and look what happened. And those people were already infiltra- infiltrating the state even before I filed my lawsuit. That's right. Because... When we knew that skill, the skill game ban was coming, I had more than one distributor for VGTs call me and say, Hermie, just be patient. Once these skill games are gone, we'll bring you some of our machines and we'll fill right in the gaps and we'll roll right on. And so basically saying it's not really that we don't want convenience stores and truck stops and restaurants and bars to have games. It's just that we want them to have our games and we want to control them. And it's just been a, it's just been something we've had to fight. We've had to try to fight for legitimacy in in some ways. You might want to say that's right uh, in court so far. And so I just wondered, kind of, what you, 
you know, what you hear and, and, and see in the field and, uh, and, and, and any ideas you might have on how we can, because I think part of why we're doing this interview is once people get to know Justin Pence and better know Bill Stanley and Hermie Sadler and why we're doing it and really who exactly are the people that we're fighting for, then I think we can change some some hearts and minds. And that's what we're really trying to do to put a personal touch on. When you as a legislator say, come hell or high water, we're banning games, even so far as to try to stick a law into the state budget, we want to ban these games so the casinos will get a, a monopoly. My hope is once they get to know more about the people and the families and everybody that's involved in this industry, maybe they'll maybe they'll feel a little bit different. You're saying putting a, a human face on it. Got to. Yeah. Well, and I think... And that is one human face right over there with Justin is. Pace. Every... Pence. Sorry, I said Pace. Every, every dollar that I make and that a lot of people that we work with make stays right in the Commonwealth. And that's what strikes me so much. It, it all stays here in the state. And isn't that what we all want? Is our state to be a better place? And, and uh, you know, it's, it's just keep things growing uh, um, organically within our state all the money staying here and not sending it to vegas those people don't care about us or or what's happening in the convenience store or you know i know uh, personal stories from a lot of the stores where i go i know i know their families i know you know you just learn to th- to know people and and uh, that care is not in in other industries like it is in this what what do you remember about the or when was the first time that you were made aware that there was a push within the Commonwealth of Virginia to ban your games? Uh, Pace, Pace and Queen of Virginia keeps us um, in the loop pretty good, but they, um, I guess, when we, when we started, you know, they, they came in slow and said you could only be in truck stops. Well, see, that's, that's, that's another part. Mm-hmm. The, the people that are fighting against us and even some legislators on the floor of the Senate and the House of Delegates – have said or want the narrative to be that these skill games came into the Commonwealth of Virginia in the middle of the night when nobody was looking. Through the back door. Through the back door. Well, and you all have covered this many times. When it first started, you could only be in a truck stop or a, a bar. And the truck stops had to sell, sell so much diesel fuel to be qualified. Mm-hmm. I had five games, five, in three different locations for a year. When, when they weren't allowed in convenience stores. Mm-hmm. And then when convenience stores opened up and, and they, they got the letter from ABC that, that said it was okay, mm-hmm. you know, we went gangbusters then and, and put them in all of our stores where we had relationships. And I guess it's always been in the back of our minds that, that people are against us. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always been, uh, it's been a battle for all that time. I don't know when. When did you file your lawsuit? Uh, we filed it in it was a June hot of, day. It was hot, Virginia. June in June of 2021. Yeah, right. Yeah, and but the game. The games were actually cut off July 1st of that right. same. They year. were still on, but they were about to go off. About and then, to go off. Yeah. So we were about to go off, and the pandemic hit, mm-hmm. and yeah. then they gave us the one year reprieve. Right. That's yeah. right. Well, this was on the back end of the one year yeah. reprieve. Uh, the one year reprieve was to expire. On July 1st. July 1st. We filed mid-June. Mid-June. Mid-June, yeah. And instead of trying to rush in there and stop the turnoff, we, we, Hermie and I talked about it and and decided for ourselves we were going to play a long game, not a short game. We'd seen somebody try a different legal avenue uh, on the shore of Virginia. That didn't work. We thought we had a better way of doing this because we were looking at this in terms of constitutional protections under the First Amendment free speech, um, uh, right? And we thought... There's a better way we can do this, but we're going to suffer from what was in June from filing, and then and the government of Virginia did everything they can to obfuscate and avoid trying to answer the complaint or answer discovery, tried to move the case out of Greensville, tried every delay tactic. And they're doing it again right now, and we're going to trial in a week, basically. Uh, but they tried everything they could. We didn't get to trial till December 2nd. Right. December 2nd or 6th? 6th. 6th. Uh, and it was a fight, <laughs> yeah, but it was a fight, and 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 we got there. Talk to me about you know, I know this was a, a busy time for us in fighting this. How were convenience stores owners and those and those people that were playing skill games? How were they? How were they feeling? I mean, did they were they worried that we weren't going to win? Were they confident we we're going to win? What we had what was several, going through their minds. We had several convenience stores that made multiple trips with us to Richmond. When we when we were lobbying in the in the streets of the or in the halls of the Capitol, 
and in the the uh, executive buildings um, trying to talk to people and trying to show the importance and how these games affect people and they were worried a lot of them are really worried and then you have the other class of people that that fell victim to the um, the gray games or all these outlaw games that came in and and even though they had uh, contracts and they ignored them and they would put gray games in and it it, it made for tough uh, relationships with some of our uh, some of our customers but they were we left our machines in 80 percent of our locations uh, we never pulled them out. We put out order signs on them. We put signs up to say, contact your state senator or delegate and, you know, tell them that you want skill in Virginia. And a lot of these stores, they had faith in us because they left them set there for six months mm -hmm. off. Um, and what you're talking about, we saw a lot of this, too. And we, we knew a lot of people that close to us and even customers of Pace and and other people that they just – weren't confident or weren't willing to wait it out and so they wanted to or financially couldn't wait it out really. financially couldn't in, in some cases that's in and I understood. some cases you i understood you know, you that. Could, but in my case like i appreciate people like you doing it right and i had to i had to be you know legal above legal i had to do i mean i because here i am the the plaintiff the poster child in the, in the lawsuit yeah but so there was a, a pretty of, big poster you know what I'm there were a lot of people that were you know, they would come tell me every day, hey, there's games over in so-and-so, games over in so-and-so. Why are your games unplugged over in so-and-so? I'm like, I get it. And if you have to go that route, you got to do what you got to do. But I've got to do it right, and I want to be representing in court people that are doing it right because I still believe a year and a half later, as you know, as we fought this thing up and down and right and wrong, everything in, in the middle, ultimately – once we get to the right resolution, which ultimately has got to come with the General Assembly, it's they got to be the ones that fix it the right way. I still think that the that the people that have done it the right way and have and have acted above the law and not taken advantage of all the confusion that the Commonwealth of Virginia caused, nobody else, they caused all this confusion. I think the people that chose to do it the right way and make the right decisions ultimately are the ones that are going to benefit when we get a resolution. But I want to get back to something you said a moment ago. You said you and some other people went to Richmond to the Pocahontas building and in the Capitol trying to lobby. What kind of reception did you get and what kind of what kind of feedback were you getting at the time? Any positive or was it all negative? And if it was negative, what was the reasoning behind them telling you that there was this push to push you out of business? We've got um – a reception that was okay if it was our legislators. Yeah. But but going to see any legislators that that I didn't live in their district, the the reception was very cold. Yeah. I think uh, you know they do. It's like they have, as Senator Stanley said many times, there's a lot of back alley, back room deals done, and it's they they smile and talk to you a little bit, but then they do something else in the back room. It seems like, and that's what's so aggravating that. Uh, it's common sense doesn't prevail to me um th these delegates um are are good to me and talk to me and and they listen they understand how it affects me how it affects my employees um and but then you wonder what happens behind closed doors is what is what I always you know you don't know what happens after you they close the door and you walk out of their office mm -hmm. but the reception in general was not overwhelming besides a few people but besides a few so how difficult has it been through this process to remain positive and and get more people to to ride the train with us to, to try to get uh, the resolution has it has, has there been times now there even during while we've been under this injunction that if you wonder because every day i wake up i tell bill all the time every day i wake up being involved in this lawsuit it's like i'm wondering what's the next email going to be what's the next dart that the commonwealth is going to try to throw at me what's the next expert they're going to hire you know here i am thinking how sad is it that i had to file a lawsuit against the state that i live in and grew and and, and and raise my family and have businesses in and there they're using tax money that i helped 
create and pay to hire experts to still come after us and try to shut me down. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bad feeling. Well, not only that. Remember, we were we were not taken seriously. We were not. We're like, oh, oh this this lawsuit say of First Amendment protections. <laughs> What's the matter with you guys? You guys are dopey. And uh, bam, we won. Then guess what? Casinos started coming after us. Filed amicus briefs in the Supreme Court. Bam, lost again. Uh, then you could see that there was fear in the eyes of the legislators who were fighting against what they wanted to do, which was to sport skill and small businesses like yours, Justin. And then you had the casino lobbies bearing down, breathing heavy down their neck as they were destroying charitable gaming uh, in this past year, as they're eliminating competition, creating those monopolies, and taking out small business owners in Virginia, Virginia from participating in the marketplace. I mean, they thought we're a joke. Now, what are we seeing on November 2nd? We're seeing like experts from Vegas coming in to tell us that we're wrong about uh, about scale Telling the judge, telling the judge he's wrong. Well, not only that, and tell the judge they're wrong. The attorney general, I love this, Justin. You have to hear this. The attorney general has changed their tactic, their defense now, because our offense was, is that the attorney general gave a legal opinion, a legal attorney general's opinion that said these are games of skill, not of chance. These are not games of chance. Therefore, they are legal. The ABC, Alcoholic Beverage Control, said after investigating these Queen of Virginia games, these are legal skill games, not games of chance. The attorney general is the attorney for the Commonwealth of Virginia and the ABC and representing the attorney general's office. And their defense is now the attorney general was wrong. Our own client was wrong. They're liars. These are not games of skill. They're games of chance. I, it would be the same as a lawyer if I walked up there and said, Hermie is a liar. Hermes the liar, don't believe him. I mean, that's how desperate they've become, but they're, they're throwing everything at us. But they're so desperate to try to undo this and protect casinos that they're willing to actually step on the heads of their own clients, including themselves, because they're both lawyer and client in the AG's office. Yeah, you and I was listening in on a deposition that y'all were taking last week with one of their experts, and everything that he was testifying to was exactly... 100% flew in the face of every testimony from the AG's office in the past. Uh, Detective Kirby from ABC, everything yep. that he had said, now they are saying, and they and they tried, and you, I don't know the legal, they tried to get everything that happened in the first trial not Exclu admitted into the mm -hmm. trial moving forward. Is that right. correct? That's absolutely right. Um, they wanted to retry and relitigate the whole case and not admit any of the evidence that we had gotten in at the uh, injunction hearing. And we're talking about what, six and a half hours worth of testimony, yeah. um, evidence. Uh, the court considered all that in the temporary part. We said, let's streamline this so we don't have to relitigate. Put it in the put it in as evidence accepted in the second trial. And they fought it. They didn't want to they didn't want to accept the stuff that they let in into the second trial. Or they didn't want to they didn't want the judge to consider the stuff that had been admitted in the first trial to be considered in the second trial. I mean, it, it, to me, it smells dis desperate. Sounds desperate. We'll see if it's desperate. So why why do you think the the majority of delegates and senators are for the casinos and not for small business and what we represent here? I would tell you that the majority, I believe, in my opinion, that the majority of delegates and senators are for, for small business and for skill games. They just can't be. Does that make sense? No, you need to verify. You need to explain. No, I thought I said it pretty succinctly. <laughs> I don't want to explain. Okay, I'm going to say it slower. Okay. They want to be supportive of small business and skill games. They can't. Some of them can't. Some of them have made pledges not to be supportive of skill. Some of them have looked into the field and said, hmm, am I going to support small businesses or am I going to support big business and casinos? Or some of them have looked out into the field and said, am I going to support small businesses in my area? Or do I really want this budget item included in the Senate and House budget? And the two people that run that budget are against skill. And so they want to, but they can't. Does that make more sense? How about being for... I mean, that's that's yeah, what, that, what that is void of is principle right. and integrity, quite frankly. What about... Any of them ever have any of them ever have a thought of being in favor of the free market system? What's that? Okay, it's only the first yeah. line when you read the Republican creed 
in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm telling you, I don't think they're, in their minds, they believe that it's inconsistent, if that makes sense as well. That makes no sense. Okay, because big business, big pharma is part of the free market system in their minds. That's why they support big pharma. But big casino is still a part of the free market but because ban- it's a, banning, a business in the in the United States. Banning Mr. Pence's games in the places that he operates them in so that the casinos can have a monopoly on those games to a dumbass like me is not what the free market system is about. Is you're not allowing the people to decide if they want to go entertain themselves with that type of uh entertainment. You're not allowing the the, the people to decide where they want to go spend their money. But it's the same mindset as a politician saying a Walmart's good for the community and then watching all of the small businesses dry up because all of that business is now going to the big box store. I mean, in their mind, that's still the free market. What they don't understand is that the backbone of the free market always depends on the entrepreneur, the small business owner, who may grow up into the big uh, corporation someday and employ a bunch of people, but they're the ones that are there day in and day out, and they're keeping the trains running on time, and they're so vital to these communities. I mean, we just drove through Radford to get to the Motor Mile Speedway. If you look at all the tiny stores on the old Main Street, the revitalization that's going on, those are all small, small businesses owned by people who are putting their blood, sweat, and tears in there, just like the convenience stores, just like our truck stops, our restaurants, our bars. Everybody's put their investment, their time, their emotion, and then what you don't want to have is a government saying, okay, you can do this, but you can't sell this product. You can't sell, you know, A and B because we're going to let, we're going to let Walmart or Target sell it. If, if Target and Walmart sell a certain product, why can't the small business owner on Main Street sell that product? The same thing is analogous to, to skill games because ultimately skill games are a product, quite frankly, games of chance are products that are offered inside the doors of Rosie's and the casinos. But they say you can't sell them outside. The small business owner can't participate in the emerging marketplace. That's the unfairness. But too often politicians see this as, well, you know, Walmart's, Walmart's commerce and free enterprise. And what they fail to see is how those decisions and that opinion, that shallow opinion that a politician has, ruins small business. That's the same analogy we're using here when it comes to skill games. And if we could get some kind of certainty, which we're all fighting for, if we could get some kind of certainty, I would hire more people. Right now, you know, we work a bunch with what we have, and and I work more than I want to work because I don't want to hire somebody and then two months later have to fire them or have to say, hey, you know, the state's shut me down, so I don't have to work for you. So if they would just let us operate, it it would be more uh, job growth and everything else for the state. When, when, Justin, when have you read the law that the budget conferees put into the? I tried state to budget? read it, and I think as the as the Senator Stanley said, it's word spaghetti at its finest. Well, I, I mean, mean, what I'm saying is, I've you, tried to read you it. as a business owner in this industry. Don't understand. If it. you read it, what did you? What did you? Did, what did you think about it, or what, 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 did, what did it say to you when you read it? What, what did it mean to you? Well, if, if you could understand it, I'm calling you as an expert witness, so it, be careful what you say. Well, it was, it didn't, I didn't feel good about my business chances when I read it. It didn't, you know, they, they said not to worry about it, but it didn't, it didn't I mean, what read did it mean, that what, way. What did, what, did, what did it mean to you? What, what did you, did you understand what they were saying in, in that? No. I did not understand it, and I felt like they were trying to, trying to do away with us through that budget language, which well, and defy a court order too, trying to be cute by one half. I think in terms of, okay, they basically admitted that SB Senate Bill nine seventy one's language was crappy, and that we were right on just the language part. So guess what? We're going to be smarter and more clever, and we're going to write some really gobbledygook crap, uh, and and we'll get that passed. Not thinking that it's worse because they are show, so shallow in their thinking. But what they've created then is another challenge to you, the small business owner, and are basically saying, win at any at every cost, at any cost, to shut down small businesses participating in the gaming market. But the whole thing is, is in the criminal law, I'm a criminal defense attorney, so, you know, Justin, if you ever need, you know, if you ever speed, give me a call. <laughs> call the Stanley Law Group. But think of it this way. You know that murder is illegal, right? 
And Justin, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know what murder is? What is it? It's killing somebody. Right. An intentional killing of somebody. First degree murders with malice. Manslaughter is maybe not with malice, a black heart, but you know, you kill somebody intentionally. Guess what? Because we understand what the law is. Laws are taken at their pr plain meaning, especially when they're applied criminally against the liberties of the citizen. When the government creates a law that r threatens, restricts, or takes away your liberties, as this new budget language does, it rewrites the criminal code and imposes criminal penalties for a guy like you who has a, a skill game that has an, has an inner counting device or delivers something other than what they've defined now as an appropriate reward. What you've just said is what every convenience store owner is saying. I don't know if I'm committing a crime or not. I don't know if this game is illegal or not. But criminal law has to be plain so that the person understands what is legal and illegal. It cannot be written in a way that one does not understand whether I'm living within the law or breaking the law. And what this new language does is when you read it, just like you said, I don't understand if my games are legal or illegal. That's what makes it unconstitutional because it's vague and overbroad and cannot be enforced. And so it just demonstrates a hatred rather than trying to do something right. It indicates to me a, an agenda driven by a big industry to harm what is the backbone of Virginia in the free enterprise market system. I feel like they should let somebody like Mr. Sadler and myself that have abundance amount of common sense and, you know, know the difference in right and wrong, let us write a law and you'd be able to understand it. It would be black and white. This law is far from that. It's, it's. Hey, Bill, you've, you've, your inclination on this new language that came out in the budget you're not 100% convinced that it came from legislative services. I'm 100% convinced it did not. That no lawyer in the Commonwealth of Virginia working for government or working for any specific legislator wrote this. Correct. I believe it came from the competing industry that doesn't want skill. Absolutely right. And this is not a law that's been passed and upheld in different states. The new language that they put in the budget that now changes the criminal code in Virginia to try to make skill games illegal cannot be found in any other state in the, in the United States. So we're now an industry, the casino industry's guinea pig, and they're operating on people's rights using the legislature as the scalpel. And that is, to me, a complete abandonment of our responsibilities as elected officials who serve the people. I think it is a, it is a shame, it's a sham, and we should we should immediately change course and never let this happen again. Otherwise, you know, we're not open for business. We're open for any business to to just run Virginia and not let Virginians run Virginia and let businesses operate within it. We've talked a couple times on the podcast, and Jason, you know, you and I had dinner last night, talked about some of this. You know, last time we went trial, it was just really the two attorneys out of the AG's office. Now, this time around, they plan to bring two or three experts and some other thing. I know there's behind the scenes working on what the judge is going to allow and not allow. Look, dude, they just released the witness list, and, and this may be after the trial. Who knows when this is actually dropped? They are putting on the list people that they never identified in discovery. So we've never had an opportunity to talk to them or find out what they're doing. Is they're so sloppy. It's not, it's, not, it, it's not illegal. I mean, they're not going to jail for it. But those people should not be allowed to testify, or we should be allowed to depose them before they testify. They're dropping names all of a sudden that we've never heard of before. But yet in discovery, we always ask each other when you're in a civil case, please give me a list of your witnesses. Tell me who may have information, because that's how you do your work. You, you find out what the other side knows instead of being ambushed, because civil law does not create ambush situations in the courts. So, yeah, they're, they are, I mean, exhibits we've never seen, witnesses we've never heard of. I mean, it's a potpourri of, of despair what, and desperation. And what you've heard from these experts, the ones you have heard from and talked to, what are they bringing to the table? Nothing. And quite frankly, one of the experts said that one of the Queen of Virginia pacematic skill games was too skillful. It required too much skill. And because it required too much skill to operate and be victorious at, it suddenly transformed into a game of chance. Believe it or not, that's what he said. Now, 
they're saying, first they say these games are all games of chance, all games of chance. But their own expert says, no, this one is a game of chance because it requires too much skill to play. Go figure that. Do any or all of these witnesses or experts, do they have proper knowledge of what the law is supposed to be in the Commonwealth of Virginia? The funny thing, it's funny you ask that. One of them, in making his opinion, never considered the new legislation. Never. Quite frankly, he was kind of confounded by it and even said when, he, when we read it to him in the deposition, yeah, that seems kind of vague. <laughs> that seems a little overbroad, which is exactly our point. So their own experts, and I've told my co-counsel, maybe we don't want to exclude their experts because I think they prove our point. The game is too skillful, and this law is way overbroad and vague. And that's what we're saying. We're saying skill games are not are constitutionally protected, and this law is applied as overbroad, vague, can't be enforced. And, and a guy like Justin Pence doesn't know whether he's committing a crime or not. So how could he know uh, to be a lawful uh, citizen when he doesn't know what the law is or can't even interpret it? And why do you think all of a sudden, Bill, the the defendants are changing their strategy as far as bolstering their case or trying to bolster their case? I always like to tell my wife, um, you know, a, a mouse a mouse fights the hardest and with the most desperation when it's cornered. And I think that's what we kind of see here. There's a little desperation. I think they're cornered. It's a hard thing to defend what they're doing. So they're throwing everything out there. They're throwing out, my client's a liar. They're not right. <laughs> when they said these are games of skills, they were lying. Uh, they're sending out experts that are saying the game is too, the game is a game of chance because it's too skillful. I mean, Hermie, I'm telling you right now, if I was developing a defense like this, or my case in chief, and including this kind of stuff for your case, representing you, then you should fire me immediately. And so for me, as a state legislator, I'm a little dismayed that our own attorney general's office is taking some of the positions that they're taking, not just inside the case, but also for guys like small business owners like Justin Pence. Um, I don't think in the long run it does very well for the Commonwealth. Why, from a layman terms, business owner, resident of Virginia who just wants fair law, equal opportunity. Why Why wouldn't there be, because this sounds, I guess it's probably too simple for, the, for what we're dealing with. Why couldn't we have an understanding of, let's continue our case until after the General Assembly session coming up and give the people in the General Assembly, some of which, to your point earlier, are maybe seeing the light a little bit or maybe mm -hmm. having second thoughts about the positions they took, what would be the harm in offering a, 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 a deal to the AG's office to say, let's, let's continue this trial through the General Assembly session and let's give the General Assembly of Virginia another crack at trying to fix this fairly and equitably across the board so that and I say this just about every time we get in this conversation, so that the skill game industry, casinos, Rosies, charitable, everybody can work together to get rid of the illegal operators in the state, which is really a problem that not enough people are talking about. We've tried. We've tried to talk reasonably with them. I think it's a, as you said early on in this conversation, it's a legislative solution that ultimately, no matter what happens in our court case, we win, they still got to fix it. We lose, they still got to fix it. Right now, with the economy as it is, and Joe Biden put us in with high inflation, uh, tax revenues are going down. We're going to need that kind of revenue and income for many things that are priorities for the Commonwealth of Virginia. I think that's going to bring people around. Why not let the pot bubble a little bit and finish itself? If we trust the legislature and not the three people that put this into the budget bill, I think you'll find that those, as I said earlier, the majority that wants to be for you, We'll look at this and say, now I can be for you. Now I'm going to support you. And I think we can find a solution. I understand, you know, there's a legislator working on a bill right now. I've gotten some phone calls of people saying, you know, uncle. They said, all right, uncle, we want to figure this out with reasonable tax and regulation uh, policies put in place. And it can happen. 
and it can be good for Virginia. So, I, yeah, I think we should. You know, we're hurtling towards trial a, a, a little over a week away. I don't think uh, the state is ready to defend this, their, their unconstitutional law. For me as a lawyer, common sense says, yeah, we should probably say, let's punt this, take it up in March if we have to, if the legislature hasn't fixed it. But common sense does not always prevail when you're fighting a government, and certainly it's not here. And so part of me as a lawyer also wants to basically say, if they're at a disadvantage and we have them on their heels, then press forward. Mm -hmm. Press the advantage you have, take the field, win it all. And so we've been in such a fight, and we've been called so many things, and we've been derided. We have been made fun of, while I'd like to think in common sense ways, as you say, right now I just want to kick their ass. And that's how I feel. So you said a while ago they, they, you thought that some of the legislators support us but can't. Do you think if we win this trial, does that allow them to support us then? Yeah, because basically what you're saying is and when the court, if the court makes a ruling favorable to Hermes' position, we have now determined on two different levels that you cannot overcome the constitutional protections, the free speech protections that skill games provide to the player, to the user. And therefore, you can't make them illegal. So if we can't get rid of them, then let's tax and regulate them and let's do it properly. Let's do it with good reason. And let's allow small businesses to be in there. You have to almost continue to punch the bully in the nose so they stop fighting you. And I think if we win, uh, as I'm confident we will, then what happens is, is they go, okay, 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 okay. We're not doing this again. We're not going to write a third piece of legislation that was given to us by a big casino and try this again and have you go back to court and whip our butt again. Let's figure out a way to get through this. I think even if, God forbid, and I'm a knock on wood, that we were not successful in getting the injunction, it still is out there because you have all of the games still operating, whether it be the skill games that were legitimately operating under the injunction or the video game terminal games of chance that are operating. You have to do something, and you can't wipe them all away. You can't get rid of them. You can't give the casinos what they want. I'm going to tell you a little quick story. I was coming over here with my daughter in the back seat, and her robotics team had decided to set up a bingo hall, basically, as a charitable fundraiser to allow them to pay the entry fees, pay for the robots, and compete statewide and nationwide in the, in the Franklin County High School Robotics Program. I saw that they were doing a bingo, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't know that that's legal under what the, what the casinos have done to charitable gaming. You may want to, you know, may want to check that out. Oh, Dad, you're stupid. You're, you don't know what you're talking about. And so I turned to her this morning and I said, so when's the bingo happening? Oh, it got pulled off because bingo put on by high school students for a charity for their own team to be able to travel to events and participate and compete is now illegal gambling according to the laws that Big Casino got passed because that's charitable gaming and it's illegal. That proves exactly what I was saying, Hermie, that they are trying to even shut down. The casinos are trying to shut down bingo halls. Any competition is the enemy to these casinos. And so if they're doing that, they're going to continue the fight until somebody has some sanity in the legislature and says, legislature and says that's enough. That's enough. And it, that can't be... I mean, the casinos... Are they that? Um, <laughs> I don't even know the right word. I mean, petty. <laughs> I mean, yeah. look, they, they, they are they scorched. All they're a scorched earth policy. Remember where casinos are born from. I mean, what well, you know, you know, there was some mafia organized crime undertones. Okay, historically, the Bugsy Seagulls of the world. You know what? Does the mafiosa want competition? Do they want anybody? Are they running, you know, a numbers racket and going, hey, you can run your own racket alongside? No, they want to dominate. That mindset now in the legitimate casino industry, I'm not saying the casino industry is that anymore, but what it's born from is take no prisoners attitude. The house always wins attitude, and there is no room for anybody else but us. And what they've seen is, is it used to be in New Jersey and Vegas, you know, and, and Tahoe. Um, now we're seeing because states are running out of revenue generation opportunities, new revenue, revenue streams. We're now going to the vices, marijuana. We're going to tax it, make money. But we don't care that we're making kids sick and getting them addicted to drugs. 
gambling. It's a vice. Casinos, slot machines, blackjack, craps tables, baccarat. Yeah, it's bad. It's really, it takes people's livelihoods away, but man, that revenue, the state becomes addicted to the revenue and is allowing the vices to come in. And so now gambling and casino gambling, that industry is seeing a proliferation of their industry. Well, their industry model is still the same. High and sharp elbows, push everybody out of the way. From that moment forward, dominate the industry and don't let up. Don't let your foot up off of their neck. That's how they run. When you and we in win in November, what will they have to be fair making policy in the next legislative session? Will that Somebody in the legislature will have to turn to the big casinos and say, look, we're not fighting your fight anymore. We have to find a way to let this happen. To find that Who does middle that person ground. in the legislature need to be, or can you say? I think it's maybe the legislative body as a whole. So maybe it's not just one person. I don't think it can be the speaker. I don't think it can be the governor. Those are your two most powerful people in the Commonwealth of Virginia next to me. So <laughs> State Senator Bill Stanley. That's yeah. right. Powerful as crap. Um, so I think it's just as a body we say, okay, like I said, uncle, you know, med call, I mean, we've, we've tried. Now let's try to do something good. We should never have done this in the first place. Now let's put a permanent solution. And once you put that stuff in stone in the law, then the casinos will go and try to bother somebody else as they try to grow their business here in the Commonwealth. And I'll bet you $500, Hermie, that there won't be four casinos in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You may see two outside three. And I think it's going to be the Paul Monkey and Bristol. Even though they've cleared land and given money to Danville, I just I think you're going to find a, a very quick saturation of the gambling marketplace for casinos in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And the problem that they see in that model is the only way Virginia let casinos in was that they said, okay, we're going to let casinos in, but you have to put it in, into underserved, underprivileged privileged areas like Bristol, Portsmouth, Danville, and now maybe potentially Petersburg. And then you had to, of course, allow the Paul Monkey, a sovereign nation in the Commonwealth of Virginia, participate. And that's the only one that's in a populated area such as Norfolk. And that's the problem. We were talking last night, Hermie and I, that if anybody in the Shenandoah Valley, if they choose to go to a casino right now or, or even after these are built, they're going to go to West Virginia or Maryland. Right. So they're going to take their money to another state because that's the closest casino. Yeah. But do you know why Northern Virginia doesn't want a casino, a stinky casino? Because they're scuzzy, just like Janet Howe. When Janet Howe says that, there's, that uh, skill games are scuzzy, She's the one that also says you're not putting a casino in my area either. Yeah. Northern Virginia, oh, that's scuzzy. And if they want to go gamble, they go across the Potomac River and they go into Maryland. Um, they only said this was okay if you put it in some of the, the places that our government has actually changed the economy of, the Industrial Revolution, in Portsmouth, Petersburg, Danville, Bristol. Government says coal is bad, Bristol. Government says manufacturing in, in the United States is bad. Send it overseas, Martinsville, Danville. Portsmouth. Do you see? Do you see a pattern here? Mm -hmm. This is the government trying to stuff their casinos into areas that their bad policies caused them from being on the top of the economic mountain in the Commonwealth of Virginia to being on the bottom. And they think it's the white pill, the panacea that's going to solve all their economic problems. And I'm telling you right now, these big casinos are going to only create more problems. But the one thing that you can always count on is a small business owner like you, Justin. A small business owner that knows that's going to handle their business right, do it the right way, serve their customers, and be a part of the community. These casinos are not a part of our community. They go back to Chicago. They go back to Las Vegas. They don't care about you. We just have to understand that. And they're going to carry their money, your money back that you lost, and maybe your house and maybe your college, kid's college fund. And they're, going to, they're not going to think for a second that they've hurt anybody in the Commonwealth of Virginia yeah, we, when they ruin lives. We've uh, in my several times, you know, Rosie's is coming to Emporia, you know, where I live. And so if they get their way, they're going to have a monopoly on games. And they're going to not only get game revenue, but they're going to get my restaurant business from Fosho and Victory Lane and my other restaurants. They're going to get my bar business because people are going to go play the games and, and do those other services. And, and, and then they're going to hire a bunch of my people away because they're going to have – because the government gave them that that uh, monopoly, they're going to have create more, be able to create more revenue, at least for the short term, and you know, and make all these great offers to employees all over the uh, the city of Emporia. So yeah, and I, you know what? Uh, and I know Justin, you were the uh, guest, but I seem to be dominating some parts of this. 
I gave a speech at the end of this week to the Rural Planning Association, a, a caucus of rural planners, zoning and planning administrators in our rural areas of Virginia. Uh, they were having a conference. I told them exactly basically what we've been talking about. They had an expert statistician from Virginia Tech come on before me who gave a brilliant presentation of demonstrating why casinos don't turn the economic fortunes around for these small areas. Because, you know, the money's going away. It doesn't stay. It's not providing great jobs. But then we had a discussion about how actual skill games encourage that small business that pays the taxes, employs the people, and serves people food and gas and whatever their needs are, and, and told them exactly what Hermie said, that you bring a Rosie's in, that's great, but they take away from the mom-and-pop restaurants that are there. They take away from the gas stations that are there. They take away from his business. That's not always a good thing. In fact, in the long run, it's a poison that slowly suffocates, just like those big box stores can, uh, that small business entrepreneur that is thriving in those rural areas that we need so much. Sounds like we need that presentation given to the senators uh, about how casinos are not. I'm willing to do it again. You know, I didn't have any notes or anything. I just kind of spoke from the heart. But, but the statistician was amazing and demonstrated in all areas where casinos have been put in in these rural areas that it's just not not just fees, not feasible ultimately in the long run for the casinos, but not healthy, not helpful for those rural, rural areas as they try to revitalize their economies. Justin, um, appreciate you being on the show because, uh, again, my, my view was I wanted to try to put a, a voice and a, and a name and a family and a small business owner that is a part of this fight you know, through Senator Stanley and I because I think sometimes it's just easy for people to, especially on the other side when they're trying to, when they're trying to wipe us out, you know, they just think it's a, it's a, they think it's a machine. Yeah. They don't think about the people behind it, and the families and things. Or that the people make. that we represent. Not, it's not just you and me, Hermie. Yeah. It's sure. the Justin Pences of the world yeah. and all those the hundreds of people to court every time we go to court. So one thing Senator Stanley will agree, and I'll tell you, people in the General Assembly listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. We both get calls every week when we have a guest on about the podcast, people inside the General Assembly. Yes, we do. So if you had an open line to legislators in the General Assembly um, as we head back to trial here in November and this, conf and this fight moves forward, what would you want to tell them? I'd want to tell them to just use common sense and look at what's best for the state. Uh, the, the state, its best interest for its people or to let his people uh, free market, like like we talked about before, let them let them be successful. Let them start small business. Let them hire people. Let us do the work in our own state. Let us make our own money and keep it here in the state. You know, um, Vegas and Jersey and Atlantic City, they don't need all this money from from uh, casinos here. Let let us do it. I mean, why not? Why not? Why not do it ourselves? Yeah, uh, that's that's my th whole standpoint. You know, keep it keep it in in house. I agree, I agree, man. That's what we're fighting for. That's what yeah, we're I mean, I don't think we can start casinos other than the Paul Monkey that are Virginians because they got that monopoly. But we need to protect if you're going to open up this industry, this new gaming industry, and, and collect tax revenue, you need to let Virginians participate, not just as the gamers, not just as the person rolling the dice, but rather as the people uh, that are using uh, gaming industry uh, instruments like uh, these these skill games to participate in the marketplace, to help their business, to help their families, to help their communities. Well, you've earned that right, Justin. You should have it. Well, it sounds cliche, but I don't know why we can't just all get along. I mean, really. Yeah. Uh, there's room, like Hermie said earlier, there's room for everybody. We really need to be working together to rid yeah. the illegals. Yeah. Justin, appreciate you being on. As Bill, always appreciate It's a great conversation. A big couple of weeks coming up for small businesses in the Commonwealth of Virginia as we return yes, sir. Uh, to the courthouse and, and continue our fight for small business. So, uh, Justin, we appreciate all the support from everybody, uh, people like you that are standing behind us and, uh, and fighting the battles every day uh, on, the, uh, on the ground, and we're doing it in the courtroom. So thank you very much. You're a fine American and a great Virginian, Justin. Well, thank you all, and I think I speak on behalf of everybody. You know, all you all have to do is put the word out and, and we'll help you. I mean, we'll rally around you. We'll do whatever we can. We'll beat the drums or whatever you want us to do. We'll, but, I mean, we'll do anything to keep this going because it's 
you know, it's, it's I care fair. about the people that work for me, and I don't want to have to tell them. I'm, I want some of these people that want are against us to have to tell them that they don't have a job. Right. I don't want to have to tell them. Now, uh, hey, uh, Hermie and I are fighting for you guys, and uh, we believe in you, and we appreciate you guys believing in us. So uh, another great conversation. Justin Pence, we appreciate everything you do as a great entrepreneur and small business owner here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. A great story. And we really appreciate your support and coming on here and let's and talking about uh, what we're doing, why it's important, and why we fight this fight. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm leaning right. And I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left. Leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the Senator is powered by Pace and Maddox. We appreciate everybody listening, and we'll see you again next week. God bless you all. Hey guys, listen up. I know these days when you watch the news, it feels like it's one hit after another and it's all bad news for the economy. Well, let me give you some good news. It's not all that bad when it comes to real estate. Let me explain. You see a year ago, man, real estate was hot, hot, hot. Everybody and their brother was trying to go out and buy another house. What did that mean? It was so competitive that a lot of folks got discouraged. So let me ask you, have you thought about buying a house in the last couple of years, but Maybe you just couldn't win a bid. I used to hear that all the time. Well, now is the time to buy. Yes, interest rates have creeped up a little bit, but what that's created is an opportunity for you. A year ago, it wasn't uncommon for there to be more than a dozen offers on a home, many of which were over list. That is not the case today. So if you got discouraged once before about trying to buy a new house, now's the time to take another look. Now, yes, interest rates have creeped up a little bit, but you're not going to overpay for the home. But here's what you will do. You'll stop throwing your money away on rent, and now you'll get a greater tax deduction. That's right. You see, at the end of the year, you're going to get a statement from your mortgage company that shows how much interest you paid, and you get to write all of that interest off. That means you could get a huge tax deduction. You never get that as a renter. Not only that, homes are still going up in value. Don't believe the hype. All of the economists believe long-term real estate always works out. Let me give you an example. Maybe way back when, in the housing collapse of 2008, you bought in 2007 and maybe overpaid. Buddy, if you hung in there, that house is worth a whole heck of a lot more now. If you've played in the stock market, you know what I'm talking about. You only lose money when you throw in the towel. Real estate long-term always performs well. So here's my advice to you. Date the rate, marry the house. Find the house that you and your family love long-term. Because here's what's not long-term, these higher rates. I've yet to see a single economist who doesn't agree with me that rates are going to return. So doesn't it make sense to get the house you want right now? And then when rates improve, man, just get a lower monthly payment. In the meantime, you'll enjoy a greater tax deduction, and that property is going to continue to appreciate, meaning you're building equity and wealth for yourself. Not only that, how about this? We're going to save you some cash at buywithconrad.com. We're going to give you the peace of mind of a seven-year guarantee. When rates improve over the next seven years, not if, but when, that's my prediction, we'll refinance you again with no new origination points. Think about that. That could save you thousands of dollars and give you the peace of mind of knowing that you got the right house for your family right now. And then when the rates improve, man, get a lower monthly payment. Now, you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but you do need to hurry to buywithconrad.com. That's the first step. You tell us how much you want to put down and what you want your monthly payment to be. We get you approved, and then you go shopping just like a cash buyer at buywithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. Seriously, if you've thought about buying a house over the last couple of years, but you got discouraged, now's the time to take another look. Let me run the numbers for you right now. You'll be glad you did at buywithconrad.com.